This Country of Ours, Chapter 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 1. How the Vikings of Old Sought and Found New Lands. In days long, long ago there dwelt in Greenland a king named Eric the Red. He was a man mighty in war, and men held him in high honour. Now one day to the court of Eric there came Bjarni, the son of Heriulf. This Bjarni was a far traveller. He had sailed many times upon the seas, and when he came home he had ever some fresh tale of marvel and adventure to tell. But this time he had a tale to tell more marvellous than any before, for he told how far away across the sea of Greenland, where no man had sailed before, he had found a new strange land. But when the people asked news of this unknown land, Bjarni could tell them little, for he had not set foot upon those far shores. Therefore the people scorned him. "'Truly you have little hardihood,' they said, "'else you had gone ashore and seen for yourself, and had given us good account of this land.' But although Bjarni could tell naught of the new strange land, save that he had seen it, the people thought much about it, and there was great talk about voyages and discoveries, and many longed to sail forth and find again the land which Bjarni the traveller had seen. But more than any other in that kingdom, Leif, the son of Eric the Red, longed to find that land. So Leif went to Eric and said, "'O oh, my father, I fain would seek the land which Bjarni the traveller has seen. Give me gold that I may buy his ship and sail away upon the seas to find it.' Then Eric the Red gave his son gold in great plenty. "'Go, my son,' he said, "'buy the ship of Bjarni the Traveller, and sail to the land of which he tells.' Then Leif, quickly taking the gold, went to Bjarni and bought his ship. Leif was a tall man, of great strength and noble bearing. He was also a man of wisdom, and just in all things, so that men loved and were ready to obey him. Now, therefore, many men came to him offering to be his companions in adventure, until soon they were a company of thirty-five men. They were all men tall and of great strength, with fair golden hair and eyes blue as the sea upon which they loved to sail, save only Tyrker, the German. Long time this German had lived with Eric the Red and was much beloved by him. Tyrker also loved Leif dearly, for he had known him since he was a child, and was indeed his foster father so he was eager to go with Leif upon this adventurous voyage. Tyrker was very little and plain. His forehead was high, and his eyes small and restless. He wore shabby clothes, and to the blue-eyed, fair-haired giants of the north he seemed indeed a sorry-looking little fellow. But all of that mattered little, for he was a clever craftsman, and Leif and his companions were glad to have him go with them. Then, all things being ready, Leif went to his father, and, bending his knee to him, prayed him to be their leader." but Eric the Red shook his head. "'Nay, my son,' he said, "'I am old and stricken in years, and no more able to endure the hardships of the sea.' "'Yet come, my father,' pleaded Leif, "'for of a certainty, if you do, good luck will go with us.' Then Eric looked longingly at the sea. His heart bade him go out upon it once again ere he died, so he yielded to the prayers of his son, and, mounting upon his horse, he rode towards the ship." When the seafarers saw him come they set up a shout of welcome, but when Eric was not far from the ship, the horse upon which he was riding stumbled, and he was thrown to the ground. He tried to rise, but could not, for his foot was sorely wounded. Seeing that, he cried out sadly, "'It is not for me to discover new lands. Go ye without me.' So Eric the Red returned to his home, and Leif went on his way to his ship with his companions." Now they busied themselves, and set their dragon-headed vessel in order, and when all was ready they spread their gaily-coloured sails, and sailed out into the unknown sea. Westward and ever westward they sailed towards the setting of the sun. For many days they sailed, yet they saw no land. Naught was about them but the restless tossing waves. But at length one day to their watching eyes there appeared a faint grey line far on the horizon. Then their hearts bounded for joy. They had not sailed in vain, for land was near. "'Surely,' said Leif, as they drew close to it, "'this is the land which Bjarni saw. Let it not be said of us that we passed it by as he did.' So, casting anchor, Leif and his companions launched a boat and went ashore. But it was no fair land to which they had come. 
far inland great snow-covered mountains rose, and between them and the sea lay flat and barren rock, where no grass or green thing grew. It seemed to Leif and his companions that there was no good thing in this land. "'I will call it Helluland, or Stoneland,' said Leif. Then he and his companions went back to the ship and put out to sea once more. They came to land again after some time, and again they cast anchor, and launched a boat and went ashore. This land was flat. Broad stretches of white sand sloped gently to the sea, and behind the level plain was thickly wooded. This land, said Leif, shall also have a name after its nature, so he called it Markland, or Woodland. Then again Leif and his companions returned to the ship, and mounting into it they sailed away upon the sea. And now fierce winds arose, and the ship was driven before the blast, so that for days these seafarers thought no more of finding new lands, but only of the safety of their ship. But at length the wind fell, and the sun shone forth once more. Then again they saw land, and, launching their boat, they rowed ashore. To the eyes of these seafaring men, who for many days had seen only the wild waste of waters, the land seemed passing fair for the grass was green, and as the sun shone upon it, it seemed to sparkle with a thousand diamonds. When the men put their hands upon the grass, and touched their mouths with their hands, and drank the dew, it seemed to them that never before had they tasted anything so sweet. So pleasant the land seemed to Leif and his companions, that they determined to pass the winter there. They therefore drew their ship up the river which flowed into the sea, and cast anchor. Then they carried their hammocks ashore, and set to work to build a house. When the house was finished, Leif called his companions together, and spoke to them. "'I will now divide our company into two bands,' he said, "'so that we may explore the country round about. One half shall stay at home, and the other half shall explore the land. But they who go to explore must not go so far away that they cannot return home at night, nor must they separate from each other, lest they be lost.' And as Leif said, so it was done." Each day a company set out to explore, and sometimes Leif went with the exploring party, and sometimes he stayed at home. But each day as evening came they all returned to their house and told what they had seen. At length, however, one day, when those who had gone abroad returned, one of their number was missing, and when the roll was called it was found that it was Tyrker, the German, who had strayed. Thereat Leif was sorely troubled, for he loved his foster-father dearly. So he spoke sternly to his men, reproaching them for their carelessness in letting Tyrker separate from them, and taking twelve of his men with him, he set out at once to search for his foster father. But they had not gone far when, to their great joy, they saw their lost comrade coming towards them. "'Why art thou so late, O my foster father?' cried Leif, as he ran to him. "'Why hast thou gone astray from the others?' But Tyrker paid little heed to Leif's questions. He was strangely excited, and rolling his eyes wildly he laughed, and spoke in German which no one understood. At length, however, he grew calmer, and spoke to them in their own language. "'I did not go much farther than the others,' he said, "'but I have found something new. I have found vines and grapes.' "'Is that indeed true, my foster-father?' said Leif. "'Of a certainty it is true,' replied Tyrker, "'for I was born where vines grow freely.' This was great news, and all the men were eager to go and see for themselves the vines which Tyrker had discovered, but it was already late, so they all returned to the house, and waited with what patience they could, until morning. Then, as soon as it was day, Tyrker led his companions to the place where he had found the grapes, and when Leif saw them he called the land Vinland because of them. He also decided to load his ship with grapes and wood, and depart homeward. So each day the men gathered grapes and felled trees until the ship was full. Then they set sail for home. The winds were fair, and with but few adventures they arrived safely at home. There they were received with great rejoicing. Henceforth Leif was called Leif the Lucky, and he lived ever after in great honour and plenty, and the land which he had discovered men called Vinland the Good. In due time, however, Eric the Red died, and after that Leif the Lucky sailed no more upon the seas, for his father's kingdom was now his, and he must needs stay at home to rule his land. But Leif's brother, Thorvald, greatly desired to go to Vinland, so that he might explore the country still further. Then when Leif saw his brother's desire, he said to him, "'If it be thy will, brother, thou mayest go to Vinland in my ship.' 
At that Thorvald rejoiced greatly, and gathering thirty men he set sail, crossed the sea without adventure, and came to the place where Leif had built his house. There he and his company remained during the winter. Then in the spring they set forth to explore the coast. After some time they came upon a fair country where there were many trees. When Thorvald saw it, he said, "'It is so fair a country that I should like to make my home here.' Until this time the Norsemen had seen no inhabitants of the land, but now as they returned to their ship they saw three mounds upon the shore. When the Norsemen came near they saw that these three mounds were three canoes, and under each were three men armed with bows and arrows, who lay in wait to slay them. When the Norsemen saw that they divided their company and put themselves in battle array and after a fierce battle they slew the savages, save one who fled to his canoe and so escaped. When the fight was over the Norsemen climbed upon a high headland and looked round to see if there were signs of any more savages. Below them they saw several mounds which they took to be the houses of the savages, and knew that it behooved them therefore to be on their guard, but they were too weary to go further, and casting themselves down upon the ground where they were, they fell into a heavy sleep." Suddenly they were awakened by a great shout, and they seemed to hear a voice cry aloud, "'Awake, Torvald, thou and all thy company, if ye would save your lives. Flee to thy ship with all thy men, and sail with speed from this land.' So Torvald and his companions fled speedily to their ship, and set it in fighting array. Soon a crowd of dark-skinned savages, uttering fearful yells, rushed upon them. They cast their arrows at the Norsemen, and fought fiercely for some time." But seeing that their arrows availed little against the strangers, and that on the other hand many of their braves were slain, they at last fled. Then, the enemy being fled, Torvald, turning to his men, asked, "'Are any of you wounded?' "'Nay,' they answered, "'we are all whole.' "'That is well,' said Torvald. "'As for me, I am wounded in the armpit by an arrow. Here is the shaft. Of a surety it will cause my death, and now I counsel you.' turn homeward with all speed, but carry me first to that headland which seemed to me to promise so pleasant a dwelling-place, and lay me there. Thus it shall be seen that I spoke truth when I wished to abide there. And ye shall place a cross at my feet, and another at my head, and call it Cross Ness ever after. So Torvald died. Then his companions buried him as he had bidden them in the land which had seemed to him so fair and as he had commanded they set a cross at his feet and another at his head, and called the place Cross Ness. Thus the first white man was laid to rest in Vinland the Good. Then when spring came the Norsemen sailed home to Greenland, and there they told Leif of all the things they had seen and done, and how his brave brother had met his death. Now when Leif's brother Thorstein heard how Thorvald had died, he longed to sail to Vinland to bring home his brother's body. So, once again, Leif's ship was made ready, and with five and twenty tall strong men, Thorstein set forth, taking with him his wife Gudrid. But Thorstein never saw Vinland the Good, for storms beset his ship, and after being driven hither and thither for many months, he lost all reckoning, and at last came to land in Greenland once more. And there Thorstein died, and Gudrid went home to Leif. Now there came to Greenland that summer a man of great wealth, named Thorfinn, and when he saw Gudrid he loved her and sought her in marriage, and Leif giving his consent to it, Thorfinn and Gudrid were married. At this time many people still talked of the voyages to Vinland, and they urged Thorfinn to journey thither and seek to find out more about these strange lands. And more than all the others Gudrid urged him to go, so at length Thorfinn determined to undertake the voyage. But it came to his mind that he would not merely go to Vinland and return home again, he resolved rather to settle there, and make it his home. Thorfinn therefore gathered about sixty men, and those who had wives took also their wives with them, together with their cattle, and their household goods. Then Thorfinn asked Leif to give him the house which he had built in Vinland, and Leif replied, I will lend the house to you, but I will not give it. So Thorfinn and Gudrid and all their company sailed out to sea, and without adventures arrived safely at Leif's house in Vinland. There they lived all that winter in great comfort. There was no lack of food either for man or beast, and the cattle they had brought with them roamed at will, and fed upon the wide prairie lands. 
All winter and spring the Norsemen dwelt in Vinland, and they saw no human beings save themselves. Then one day in early summer they saw a great troop of natives come out of the wood. They were dark and little, and it seemed to the Norsemen very ugly, with great eyes and broad cheeks. The cattle were near, and as the savages appeared the bull began to bellow, and when the savages heard that sound they were afraid and fled. For three whole weeks nothing more was seen of them. After that time, however, they took courage again and returned. As they approached, they made signs to show that they came in peace, and with them they brought huge bales of furs which they wished to barter. The Norsemen, it is true, could not understand the language of the natives, nor could the natives understand the Norsemen, but by signs they made known that they wished to barter their furs for weapons. This, however, Thorfinn forbade. Instead he gave them strips of red cloth, which they took very eagerly and bound about their heads. Thorfinn also commanded his men to take milk to the savages, and when they saw it they were eager to buy and drink it, so that it was said many of them carried away their merchandise in their stomachs. Thus the days and months passed. Then one summer day a little son was born to Thorfinn and Gudrid. They called him Snorri, and he was the first white child to be born on the continent, which later men called the New World. Thus three years went past, but the days were not all peaceful for quarrels arose between the newcomers and the natives, and the savages attacked the Norsemen and killed many of them. Then Thorfinn said he would no longer stay in Vinland, but would return to Greenland. So he and all his company made ready their ship, and sailed out upon the seas, and came at length safely to Greenland. Then after a time Thorfinn sailed to Iceland. There he made his home for the rest of his life, the people holding him in high honour. Snorri also, his son who had been born in Vinland, grew to be a man of great renown. Such are some of the old Norse stories of the first finding of America. The country which Leif called Helluland was most likely Labrador, Markland, Newfoundland, and Vinland, Nova Scotia. Besides these there were many other tales of voyages to Vinland, for after Leif and his brothers many other Vikings of the North sailed, both from Greenland and from Norway, to the fair western lands. Yet although they sailed there so often, these old Norsemen had no idea that they had discovered a vast continent. They thought that Vinland was merely an island, and the discovery of it made no stir in Europe. By degrees, too, the voyages thither ceased. In days of wild warfare at home, the Norsemen forgot the fair western land which Leif had discovered. They heard of it only in minstrel tales, and it came to be for them a sort of fairyland, which had no existence, save in a poet's dream. But now wise men have read these tales with care, and many have come to believe that they are not mere fairy stories. They have come to believe that hundreds of years before Columbus lived, the Vikings of the North sailed the western seas, and found the land which lay beyond, the land which we now call America. End of chapter 1. Read on September 30th, 2007, in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours. Chapter 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 2. The Sea of Darkness and the Great Faith of Columbus. In those far-off times, besides the Vikings of the North, other daring sailors sailed the seas. But all their sailings took them eastward, for it was from the east that all the trade and the riches came in those days. To India, and to far Cathay, sailed the merchant through the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, to return with a rich and fragrant cargo of silks and spices, pearls and priceless gems. None thought of sailing westward, for to men of those days the Atlantic Ocean was known as the Outer Sea, or the Sea of Darkness. There was nothing to be gained by venturing upon it, much to be dreaded. It was said that huge and horrible sea-dragons lived there, ready to wreck and swallow down any vessel that might venture near. An enormous bird also hovered in the skies, waiting to pounce upon vessels, and bear them away to some unknown eyrie. Even if any foolhardy adventurers should defy these dangers, and escape the horror of the dragons and the bird, 
other perils threatened them, for far in the west there lay a bottomless pit of seething fire. That was easy of proof. Did not the face of the setting sun glow with the reflected light as it sank in the west? There would be no hope nor rescue for any ship that should be drawn into that awful pit. Again it was believed that the ocean flowed downhill, and that if a ship sailed down too far it would never be able to get back again. These and many other dangers, said the ignorant people of those days, threatened the rash sailors who should attempt to sail upon the sea of darkness. So it was not wonderful that for hundreds of years men contented themselves with the well-known routes, which indeed offered adventure enough to satisfy the heart of the most daring. But as time passed, these old trade routes fell more and more into the hands of Turks and infidels. Port after port came under their rule, and infidel pirates swarmed in the Indian Ocean and Mediterranean until no Christian vessel was safe. At every step Christian traders found themselves hampered and hindered, and in danger of their lives, and they began to long for another way to the lands of spice and pearls. Then it was that men turned their thoughts to the dread sea of darkness. The less ignorant among them had begun to disbelieve the tales of dragons and fiery pits. The world was round, said wise men. Why, then, if that were so, India could be reached by sailing west, as well as by sailing east. Many men now came to this conclusion, among them an Italian sailor named Christopher Columbus. The more Columbus thought about his plan of sailing west to reach India, the more he believed in it, and the more he longed to set out. But without a great deal of money, such an expedition was impossible, and Columbus was poor. His only hope was to win the help and friendship of a king, or some other great and wealthy person. The Portuguese were in those days a seafaring people, and their ships were to be found wherever ships dared go. Indeed, Prince Henry of Portugal did so much to encourage voyages of discovery that he was called Henry the Navigator. And although he was by this time dead, the people still took great interest in voyages of discovery. So at length Columbus determined to go to King John of Portugal, and tell him of his plans, and ask for his aid. King John listened kindly enough, it seemed, to what Columbus had to say, but before giving him any answer he said that he must consult his wise men. These wise men looked upon the whole idea of sailing to the west to reach the east as absurd, so King John refused to give Columbus any help. Yet although most of King John's wise men thought little of the plan, King John himself thought that there was something in it. But instead of helping Columbus, he meanly resolved to send out an expedition of his own. This he did, and when Columbus heard of it he was so angry that he left Portugal, which for more than ten years he had made his home. He was poor, and in debt, so he left the country secretly, in fear of the king and of those to whom he owed money. When Columbus thus fled from Portugal, penniless and in debt, he was a man over forty. He was a bitterly disappointed man, too, but he still clung to his great idea. So he sent his brother Bartholomew to England to beg King Henry the Seventh to help him, while he himself turned towards Spain. Bartholomew, however, reached England in an evil hour for his quest. For Henry the Seventh had but newly wrested the crown from Richard the Third, and so had no thought to spare for unknown lands. Christopher also arrived in Spain at an unfortunate time, for the Spaniards were carrying on a fierce warfare against the Moors, and King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella had little thought or money to spare for any other undertaking. Therefore, although Ferdinand listened to what Columbus had to say, for the time being he could promise no help. So years passed. Columbus remained in Spain, for in spite of all his rebuffs and disappointments he did not despair. As the court moved from place to place, he followed it, hoping always that the day would come when the king and queen would listen to him, and believe in his great enterprise. Meanwhile he lived in want and misery, and just kept himself from starvation by making and selling maps. To the common people he seemed a madman, and as he passed through the streets in his worn and threadbare garments, children jeered and pointed fingers of scorn at him. Yet, in spite of mockery and derision, Columbus clung to his faith. Indeed, it burned in him so strongly that at length he made others share it too, and men who were powerful at court became his friends. 
At last the war with the Moors ended victoriously for Spain. Then these friends persuaded Queen Isabella to listen again to what Columbus had to say. To this the Queen consented, and when she heard how poor Columbus was, she sent him some money, so that he might buy clothes fit to appear at court. When Columbus heard the good news he was overjoyed. As quickly as might be he bought new clothes, and mounting upon a mule he rode towards Granada. But when Columbus arrived, he found the court still in the midst of rejoicings to celebrate victory. Among the light-hearted, gaily-dressed throng, there was no one who had a thought to spare for the melancholy, white-haired dreamer who passed like a dark shadow amidst them. With his fate, as it were, trembling in the balance, Columbus had no heart for rejoicing, so he looked on, with indifference, almost with contempt. But at length his day came. At length all the jubilation was over, and Ferdinand and Isabella turned their thoughts to Columbus. He came before them, and talked so earnestly of his great project, that they could not but believe in it. The day was won. Both king and queen, but more especially the queen, were willing to help the great enterprise. Now, however, Columbus himself all but wrecked his chances. He had dreamed so long about this splendid adventure, he was so filled with belief in its grandeur, that he demanded conditions such as would hardly have been granted to the greatest prince in the land. Columbus demanded that he should be made admiral and viceroy of all the lands he might discover, and that after his death this honour should descend to his son, and to his son's son for ever and ever. He also demanded a tenth part of all the pearls, precious stones, gold, silver, and spices, or whatever else he might gain by trade or barter. At these demands the grandees of Spain stood aghast. What? This shabby dreamer, this penniless beggar, aspired to honour and dignities fit for a prince? It was absurd, and not to be thought of. If this beggarly sailor would have Spain assist him, he must needs be more humble in suit." But not one jot would Columbus abate of his demands. So the council broke up, and Columbus, with anger and disappointment in his heart, mounted his mule and turned his face towards the court of France. All the seven long years during which he had waited, and hoped, and prayed in Spain had been wasted. Now he would go to the king of France, and make his last appeal there. But Columbus had left friends behind him, friends who had begun to picture to themselves almost as vividly as he the splendours of the conquest he was to make. Now these friends sought out the Queen. In glowing words they painted to her the glory and the honour which would come to Spain if Columbus succeeded. And if he failed, why, what were a few thousand crowns, they asked. And as the Queen listened, her heart beat fast, the magnificence of the enterprise took hold upon her, and she resolved that, come what might, Columbus should go forth on his adventure. Ferdinand, however, still looked coldly on. The war against the Moors had been long and bitter, his treasury was empty. Whence, he asked himself, was money forthcoming for this mad scheme? Isabella, however, had done with prudence and caution. "'If there is not money enough in Aragon,' she cried, I will undertake this adventure for my own kingdom of Castile, and if need be I will pawn my jewels to do it. While these things were happening, Columbus, sick at heart, was slowly plodding on the road to France. But he only went a little way on his long journey, for just as he was entering a narrow pass not far from Granada, where the mountains towered above him, he heard the thud of horses' hoofs. It was a lonely and silent spot among the hills where robbers lurked, and where many a man had been slain for the money and jewels he carried. Columbus, however, had nothing to dread. He carried with him neither gold nor jewels. He went forth from Spain a beggar, even as he had come. But if fear he had any, it was soon turned to incredulous joy, for when the horsemen came up they told Columbus that his friends had won the day for him, and that he must return. At first Columbus hesitated. He found it hard to believe that truly, at last, he had his heart's desire. When, however, the messenger told him that the Queen herself bade him return, he hesitated no longer. Joyfully turning his mule, he hastened back to Granada. 
At last Columbus had won his heart's desire, and he had only to gather ships and men and set forth westward. But now a new difficulty arose. For it was out upon the terrible sea of darkness that Columbus wished to sail, and men feared to face its terrors. Week after week went past, and not a ship or a man could Columbus get. He persuaded and implored in vain. No man was brave enough to follow him to the unknown horrors of the sea of darkness. Therefore, as entreaty and persuasion proved of no avail, Columbus sought help from the king, who gave him power to force men to go with him. Even then all sorts of difficulties were thrown in the way. Columbus, however, overcame them all, and at length his three ships were ready. But it had taken many months. It was February when he turned back so gladly to Granada. It was the third of August before everything was in order. Before dawn upon the day he sailed, Columbus entered the church, in the little seafaring town of Palos, where his ships lay at anchor. There he humbly confessed his sins, received the sacrament, and committed himself to God's all-powerful guidance. The crew, wild rough fellows, many of them, followed his example. Then Columbus stepped on board his ship, the Santa Maria, and turned his face westward. He was filled with exultation, but all Palos was filled with gloom, and upon the shore a great crowd gathered to bid a last farewell to these daring adventurers. And as the ships spread their sails and sped forth in the morning light, the people wept and lamented sorely for they never thought again to see their loved ones, who were about to adventure forth upon the terrible Sea of Darkness. End of chapter 2. Read on October 1st, 2007, in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours, Chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 3. How Columbus fared forth upon the Sea of Darkness, and came to pleasant lands beyond. At first the voyage upon which Columbus and his daring companions now set forth lay through seas already known, but soon the last landmark was left behind, and the three little vessels, smaller than river craft of to-day, were alone upon the trackless waste of waters. And when the men saw the last trace of land vanish, their hearts sank, and they shed bitter tears, weeping for home and the loved ones they thought never more to see. On and on they sailed, and as day after day no land appeared, the men grew restless. Seeing them thus restless, and lest they should be utterly terrified at being so far from home upon this seemingly endless waste of waters, Columbus determined to keep them from knowing how far they had really gone. So he kept two reckonings. One in which the real length of the ship's daily journey was given he kept to himself. The other, in which the journey was given as much shorter, he showed to the sailors. A month went past. Six weeks went past, and still there was no trace of land. Then at length came signs. Snowbirds, which never ventured far to sea, flew round the ships. Now the waves bore to them a rudely carved stick. Now the ships ploughed away through masses of floating weeds. All these signs were at first greeted with joy and hope, and the sailors took heart. But as still the days went past and no land appeared, they lost heart again. The fields of weeds which they had at first greeted with joy now became an added terror. Would they not be caught in this tangle of weeds, they asked, and never more win a way out of it? To their fearful and superstitious minds, the very breeze which had borne them softly onward became a menace. For if the wind always blew steadily from the east, how was it possible ever to return to Spain? So Columbus was almost glad when a contrary wind blew, for it proved to his trembling sailors that one at least of their fears was groundless. But it made little difference. The men were now utterly given over to gloomy terrors. Fear robbed them of all ambition. Ferdinand and Isabella had promised a large sum of money to the man who should first discover land, but none cared now to win it. 
All they desired was to turn home once more. Fear made them mutinous also, so they whispered together and planned in secret to rid themselves of Columbus. It would be easy, they thought, to throw him overboard some dark night, and then give out that he had fallen into the sea by accident. No one would know. No one in Spain would care, for Columbus was, after all, but a foreigner and an upstart. The great ocean would keep the secret. They would be free to turn homeward. Columbus saw their dark looks, heard the murmurs of the crews, and did his best to hearten them again. He spoke to them cheerfully, persuading and encouraging, laughing at them, while in his heart he wept. Still the men went sullenly about their work, but at length one morning a sudden cry from the Pinta shook them from out their sullen thoughts. It was the captain of the Pinta who shouted, "'Land! Land, my lord!' he cried. "'I claim the reward!' And when Columbus heard that shout, his heart was filled with joy and thankfulness, and bearing his head he sank upon his knees, giving praise to God. The crew followed his example. Then, their hearts suddenly light and joyous, they swarmed up the masts and into the rigging to feast their eyes upon the goodly sight. All day they sailed onward toward the promised land. The sun sank, and still all night the ships sped on their joyous way. But when morning dawned, the land seemed no nearer than before. Hope died away again, and sorrowfully as the day went on, the woeful truth that the fancied land had been but a bank of clouds was forced upon Columbus. Again for days the ships sailed on, and as still no land appeared, the men again began to murmur. Then one day, when Columbus walked on deck, he was met, not merely with sullen looks, but with angry words. The men clamoured to return, and if the admiral refused, why, so much the worse for him, they would endure no longer. Bravely the admiral faced the mutineers. He talked to them cheerfully. He reminded them of what honour and gain would be theirs when they returned home, having found the new way to India, of what wealth they might win by trading. Then he ended sternly. "'Complain how you may,' he said. I have to go to the Indies, and I will go on till I find them, so help me God. For the time being the admiral's stern, brave words cowed the mutineers, but not for much longer. Columbus knew right well would they obey him if land did not soon appear, and in his heart he prayed God that it might not be long delayed. The next night Columbus stood alone upon the poop of the Santa Maria. Full of anxious thoughts he gazed out into the darkness, then suddenly it seemed to him that far in the distance he saw a glimmering light appear and disappear once and again. It was as if some one walking carried a light, but so fearful was Columbus lest his fervent hopes had caused him to imagine this light that he would not trust his own eyes alone. So he called to one of his officers and asked him if he saw any light. "'Yes,' replied the officer, "'I see a light.' Then Columbus called a second man, he could not at first see the light, and in any case neither of them thought much of it. Columbus, however, made sure that land was close, and calling the men about him he bade them keep a sharp lookout, promising a silken doublet to the man who should first see land. So till two o'clock in the morning the ships held on their way. Then from the Pinta there came again a joyful shout of, "'Land! Land!' This time it proved no vision, it was land indeed, and at last the long-looked-for goal was reached. The land proved to be an island covered with beautiful trees, and as they neared the shore the men saw naked savages crowding to the beach. In awed wonder these savages watched the huge white birds, as the ships with their great sails seemed to them. Nearer and nearer they came, and when they reached the shore and folded their wings, the natives fled in terror to the shelter of the forest. But seeing that they were not pursued, their curiosity got the better of their fear, and returning again they stood in silent astonishment to watch the Spaniards' land. First of all came Columbus. Over his glittering steel armour he wore a rich cloak of scarlet, and in his hand he bore the royal standard of Spain. Then, each at the head of his own ship's crew, came the captains of the Pinta and the Niña, 
each carrying in his hand a white banner with a green cross, and the crowned initials of the king and queen, which was the special banner devised for the great adventure. Every man was dressed in his best, and the gay-coloured clothes, the shining armour and fluttering banners made a gorgeous pageant. Upon it the sun shone in splendour, and the blue sky was reflected in a bluer sea, while scarlet flamingos, startled at the approach of the white men, rose in brilliant flight. As Columbus landed he fell upon his knees and kissed the ground, and with tears of joy running down his cheeks he gave thanks to God, the whole company following his example. Then rising again to his feet Columbus drew his sword, and solemnly took possession of the island in the name of Ferdinand and Isabella. When the ceremony was over the crew burst forth into shouts of triumph and joy. They crowded round Columbus, kneeling before him to kiss his hands and feet, praying forgiveness for their insolence and mutiny, and promising in the future to obey him without question. For Columbus it was a moment of pure joy and triumph. All his long years of struggle and waiting had come to a glorious end. Yet he knew already that his search was not finished, his triumph not yet complete. He had not reached the eastern shores of India, the land of spice and pearls. He had not even reached Sipango, the rich and golden isle. But he had, at least, he thought, found some outlying island off the coast of India, and that India itself could not be far away. He never discovered his mistake, so the group of islands nowhere near India, but lying between the two great continents of America, are known as the West Indies. Columbus called the island upon which he first landed San Salvador, and for a long time it was thought to be the island which is still called San Salvador, or Cat Island. But lately people have come to believe that Columbus first landed upon an island a little further south, now called Watling Island. From San Salvador Columbus sailed about and landed upon several other islands, naming them and taking possession of them for Spain. He saw many strange and beautiful fruits— trees of a thousand sorts, straight and tall enough to make masts for the largest ships of Spain. He saw flocks of gaily coloured parrots and many other birds that sang most sweetly. He saw fair harbours, so safe and spacious, that he thought they might hold all the ships of the world. But of such things Columbus was not in search. He was seeking for gold and jewels, and at every place he touched he hoped to find some great eastern potentate, robed in splendour and seated upon a golden throne. Instead, everywhere he found only naked savages. They were friendly and gentle, and what gold they had, but it was little indeed, they willingly bartered for a few glass beads or little tinkling bells. By signs, however, some of these savages made Columbus understand that further south there was a great king who was so wealthy that he ate off dishes of wrought gold. Others told him of a land where the people gathered gold on the beach at night-time by the light of torches. Others again told him of a land where gold was so common that the people wore it on their arms and legs, and in their ears and noses as ornaments. Others still told of islands where there was more gold than earth, but Columbus sought these lands in vain. In his cruisings Columbus found Cuba, and thought at first it must be the island of Sipango, but finding himself mistaken, he decided at length that he had landed upon the most easterly point of India. He could not be far, he thought, from the palace of the Grand Khan, and choosing out two of his company he sent them as ambassadors to him. But after six days the ambassadors returned, having found no gold, and instead of the Grand Khan having seen only a savage chieftain. These ambassadors found no gold, but, had they only known it, they found something quite as valuable. For they told how they had met men and women with firebrands in their hands made of herbs, the end of which they put in their mouths and sucked, blowing forth smoke. And these firebrands they called tabacos. The Spaniards also discovered that the natives of these islands used for food a root which they dug out of the earth but they thought nothing of these things, for what were roots and dried herbs to those who came in search of gold and gems and precious spices? So they brought home neither potatoes nor tobacco. 
So far the three little vessels had kept together, but now the captain of the Pinta parted company with the others, not because of bad weather, says Columbus in his diary, but because he chose, and out of greed, for he thought that the Indians would show him where there was much gold. This desertion grieved Columbus greatly, for he feared that Pinzon might find gold, and sailing home before him cheat him of all the honour and glory of the quest. But still the admiral did not give up, but steered his course, in the name of God and in search of gold and spices, and to discover land. So from island to island he went seeking gold, and finding everywhere gentle, kindly savages, fair birds and flowers, and stately trees. End of chapter 3 Read on October 14, 2007, in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours, Chapter 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 4. How Columbus Returned in Triumph. Christmas Eve came, and the Admiral, being very weary, went below to sleep, leaving a sailor to steer the ship. But this sailor thought he too would like to sleep, so he gave the tiller in charge of a boy. Now throughout the whole voyage the Admiral had forbidden this. Whether it was stormy or calm, he had commanded that the helm was never to be entrusted to a boy. This boy knew very little of how to steer a ship, and being caught in a current it was cast upon a sandbank and wrecked. By good luck everyone was saved, and landed upon the island of Haiti. But Columbus had now only one little vessel, and it was not large enough to carry all the company. Many of them, however, were so delighted with the islands that they wanted to stay there and they had often asked the admiral's leave to do so. Columbus therefore now determined to allow some of his men to remain to found a little colony, and trade with the Indians, and he trusted in God that when he came back from Spain, as he intended to do, he would find a ton of gold collected by them, and that they would have found a gold mine, and such quantities of spices, that the sovereigns would, in the space of three years, be able to undertake a crusade, and conquer the holy sepulchre. So, out of the wreck of the Santa Maria, Columbus built a fort, and from the many who begged to be left behind he chose forty-four, appointing one of them, Diego de Arana, as governor. He called the fort La Navida, or the Nativity, in memory of the day upon which it was founded. The island itself he called Española, or Little Spain. Then on Friday the 4th of January, 1493, the Nina spread her sails and slowly glided away, leaving in that far island amid the unknown seas the first colony of white men ever settled in the West. Two days after Columbus set forth upon his homeward voyage, he fell in again with the Pinta. The master had found no gold, so he determined to join Columbus once more. He now came on board, and tried to make his peace with Columbus, but the admiral received him coldly, for he had little faith in his excuses and now once more together the two little vessels sailed homeward. But soon storms arose. The ships were battered by wind, tossed about hither and thither by waves, and at length separated again. More than once Columbus feared that his tiny vessel would be engulfed in the stormy seas, and the results of his great enterprise never be known. But at length the shores of Portugal were sighted, and on Friday the 15th of March, 1493, he landed again at Palos in Spain, from whence he had set forth more than seven months before. The people of Palos had hardly hoped to see again those who had sailed away on so desperate an adventure. Now, when they saw only one of the three vessels return, their joy was mingled with grief. When, however, they learned that Columbus returned in triumph, and that India had been reached, their joy knew no bounds. Shops were closed, bells were rung, and all the people in holiday attire thronged to the harbour, and with shouts and cheers they bore Columbus in triumph to the church, there to give thanks to God for his safe and glorious return. And ere the shouts had died away, a second vessel was seen approaching. 
it was the Pinta, which, though parted from the Niña, had also weathered the storms and now come safely to port. At once on landing Columbus had sent a letter to the king and queen telling them of his return. Now he received an answer. It was addressed to Don Christopher Columbus, our admiral of the ocean sea, viceroy and governor of the islands discovered in the Indies. It bade him to come at once to court. It told him that a new expedition would immediately be fitted out, so with a heart overflowing with joy and pride Columbus set forth to Barcelona, where the king and queen then were. The great news of his voyage and discovery had outsped him, and the people of Barcelona received him with every mark of respect and honour. As he passed through the streets, riding on a splendid horse and surrounded by the greatest nobles of Spain, they cheered him again and again. They gazed in wonder also at the dark-skinned savages, the gaily coloured parrots, and other strange things he had brought with him from out the sea of darkness. Sitting on a throne of state beneath a canopy of cloth of gold, with the young prince of Spain beside them, the king and queen received Columbus. At his approach they rose, and standing they welcomed back to their realm as a mighty prince, he who had gone forth a simple sailor. And as Columbus would have knelt to kiss their hands, they raised him, and bade him be seated beside them as an equal. Seldom did the haughty rulers of Spain show such great honour even to the proudest nobles in the land. And so, while king and queen and courtiers listened breathlessly, Columbus told of all he had done, of all the marvels he had seen, of the richness and fairness of the lands he had found and claimed for Spain. And when he had finished, the king and queen fell upon their knees, and clasping their hands, they raised eyes filled with tears of joy to heaven, giving thanks to God for his great mercies. The courtiers, too, fell upon their knees and joined their prayers to those of the king and queen, while over all the triumphant notes of the Te Deum rang out. So ended the great voyage of Columbus. He had shown the way across the sea of darkness. He had proved that all the stories of its monsters and other dangers were false. But even he had no idea of the greatness of his discovery. He never realized that he had shown the way to a new world. He believed, to the day of his death, that he had indeed found new islands, but that his greatest feat was that of finding a new way to the old world. Yet now being made a noble he took for his coat of arms a group of golden islands in an azure sea, and for a motto the words, To Castile and Leon, Columbus gave a new world. Now began a time of pomp and splendour for Columbus. He who had gone forth a penniless sailor now rode abroad in gorgeous array. Often he might be seen with the queen on one hand, and John, the young prince of Spain, on the other. Sometimes even the king himself would ride with him, and seeing him so high in royal favour, all the greatest and proudest nobles of the land were eager to make much of him. So they fated him, flattered him, and spread banquets for him. But some were jealous of the great fame of Columbus, and they made light of his discoveries. It is told how, one day, at a banquet, when every one talked of these wonderful deeds, one of the guests spoke slightingly of them. "'It is all very well,' he said to Columbus, "'but in a great country like Spain, where there are such numbers of daring sailors and learned folk besides, many another man might have done the same as you. We should have found the Indies, even if you had not.' To this speech Columbus answered nothing, but he asked for an egg to be brought to him. When it was brought, he placed it on the table, saying, "'Sirs, I will lay a wager with any of you that you cannot make this egg stand up without anything at all to support it.' One after the other they tried, but no one could do it. At length it came round to Columbus again, and he, taking it in his hand, struck it sharply on the table so that one end was chipped a little, and it stood upright. "'That, my lord, is my answer,' he said." looking at the courtier who had scoffed. And all the company were silent, for they saw he was well answered. Columbus had shown that, after a deed is once done, it is simple, and every one knows how to do it. What he had done in sailing across the sea of darkness was only wonderful, because no one else had thought of doing it. 
Portugal was now very jealous of Spain's success, and King Ferdinand of Spain was fearful lest King John of Portugal should seize the new islands which Columbus had discovered. So he appealed to the Pope to settle the matter. And the Pope decided that all new lands discovered west of an imaginary line drawn through the Atlantic Ocean west of the Azores and from pole to pole should belong to Spain. All discoveries east of this line should belong to Portugal. If you will look at a map of the world, you will see that this gave to Spain all the Americas with their islands, except a little bit of Brazil, and to Portugal the whole of Africa. But almost before this matter was settled, Columbus had set forth again on another voyage across the great ocean, now no longer the Sea of Darkness. This time he had no difficulty in getting a company, for every one was eager to go with him, even many of the sons of great nobles. This time, too, the passage was made without any doubts and fears, but with joyful expectations. Columbus had hoped great things of the little colony that he had left behind him, but when he cast anchor one night before the fort, his heart sank. All was dark and silent on shore. Yet still hoping, he ordered two cannon to be fired as signal to the colonists. The cannon boomed through the still warm darkness of the night, and slowly the echoes died away, but there was no answer save the sighing of the sea and the scream of the startled birds. From the fort there came no sound or any sign of life, and with sad forebodings the Spaniards waited for the dawn. Then it was seen that the fort was a ruin. It had been burned and sacked. Torn clothing and broken vessels were strewn around, but as the Spaniards wandered sadly among the ruins, they found no trace of their companions, save eleven graves, with the grass growing above them. At first no natives would come near the white men, for they feared their anger, but at length, tempted by the offer of gifts and other friendly signs, they came. They told how the Spaniards had quarrelled amongst themselves, how the fort had been attacked by unfriendly Indians from another island, and how all the white men had been slain. Thus ended the first white colony ever planted in western lands. All traces of it have vanished, and upon the spot where La Navida stood there is now a little fishing village, called Petit Anse. Columbus founded other colonies, but they succeeded no better than the first one. In all he made four voyages across the Atlantic, and in the third he landed upon the coast of South America, near the mouth of the Orinoco. But Columbus did not know that at last he had discovered the great double continent of America. He thought that he had merely discovered another island, and he named it La Isla Santa. Afterwards he was so delighted at the beauty of the land that he thought he must have found the Garden of Eden, so he became certain that he had landed on the eastern corner of Asia. In 1506 Columbus died, and it is sad to think that he who, by his great faith and great daring, led the way across the sea of darkness and gave a new world to the old, died in poverty and neglect. The men who had wept for joy at the news of his discovery shed no tear over his grave. He died unwept, unhonoured, and unsung. Years passed before men recognized what a great man had dwelt among them. Years passed before any monument was raised to his memory. But indeed he had scarce need of any, for as has well been said, the new world is his monument, and every child of the new world must surely honour that monument, and seek never to deface it. End of chapter 4. Read on October 14th, 2007, in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours, Chapter 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This Country of Ours, by H. E. Marshall, Chapter 5. How America was named. The New World is his monument, and yet the New World does not bear the name of Columbus, so in this chapter I am going to tell you how America was named. As soon as Columbus had shown the way across the Sea of Darkness, many were eager to follow in his footsteps. There is not a man, he says himself, down to the very tailors who does not beg to be allowed to become a discoverer. 
Among the many who longed to sail the seas there was a man named Amerigo Vespucci. Like Columbus, Amerigo Vespucci was an Italian. He was born in Florence, and there for nearly forty years he lived quietly, earning his living as a clerk in the great merchant house of Medici. But although he was diligent at business, his thoughts were not wholly taken up with it, and in his leisure hours he loved to read books of geography and pore over maps and charts. After a time business took Amerigo to Spain. He was there when Columbus returned from his famous first voyage, and very likely saw him pass through the streets of Barcelona on his day of triumph. Just when Amerigo and Columbus met we do not know, but very soon we find Amerigo in the service of the merchant who supplied Columbus with food and other necessaries for his second voyage. It has been thought by some that Vespucci went with Columbus on this voyage, but that is not very likely. It was about this time, however, that Vespucci went on his first voyage, in which he explored the coast of Venezuela, or of Central America. It is very doubtful which. Before going on this voyage he had been in Spain about four years, and not having succeeded very well as a merchant he decided to give up trading, and take to sea life. No voyages, perhaps, have been more written about and fought over than those of Amerigo Vespucci. Some will have it that he went only two voyages, and say he was a braggart and a vainglorious fool if he said he went more. Others think that he went at least four voyages, and probably six, and most people are now agreed that these last are right, and that he who gave his name to the great double continent of America was no swaggering pretender, but an honest and upright man. In the first two voyages that he made Vespucci sailed under the flag of Spain. In the second two he sailed in the service of the King of Portugal, but after his fourth voyage he returned again to Spain. There he received a large salary and the rank of captain. Later he was made pilot major of Spain, and was held in high honour till his death. Yet in all the voyages Vespucci went, whether under the flag of Portugal or of Spain, he was never leader. He went as astronomer, or as pilot, while other men captained the expeditions. It is from Amerigo's letters alone that we gather the little we know about his voyages. For although he says in one of his letters that he has written a book called The Four Voyages, it has never been found, and perhaps was never published. One long letter, however, which he wrote to an old schoolfellow, was so interesting that it was published and read by many people all over Europe. It was, says an old English writer, abroad in every man's hands. Amerigo's voyages led him chiefly to Central and South America, and he became convinced that South America was a continent. So soon, what with the voyages of Vespucci and the voyages of other great men, it became at last quite certain that there was a vast continent beyond the Atlantic Ocean. Mapmakers, therefore, began to draw a huge island, large enough to form in itself a continent, south of the equator. They called it the New World, or the Land of the Holy Cross, but the northern continent was still represented on the maps by a few small islands, or as a part of Asia. Thus years passed. Daring sailors still sailed the stormy seas in search of new lands, and learned men read the tales of their adventures and wrote new books of geography. Then one day a professor who taught geography at the monastery of Sandy in Alsace published a little book on geography. In it he spoke of Europe, Asia, and Africa, the three parts of the world as known to the ancients. Then he spoke of the fourth part, which had been discovered by Amerigo Vespucci, by which he meant what we now call South America. And, continues this professor, I do not see what is rightly to hinder us calling this part Amerige, or America, that is, the land of Americus, after its discoverer, Americus. This is the first time the word America was ever used, and little did this old German professor— writing in his quiet Alsatian college, think that he was christening the great double continent of the new world. And as little did Amerigo think, in writing his letter to his old schoolfellow, that he was to be looked upon as the discoverer of the new world. At first the new name came slowly into use, and it appears for the first time on a map, made about 1514. 
In this map America is shown as a great island continent lying chiefly south of the equator. All the voyages which Columbus had made had been north of the equator. No man yet connected the land south of the equator with him, and it was at first only to this south land that the name America was given. Thirty years and more went by. Many voyages were made, and it became known for certain that Columbus had not reached the shores of India by sailing west, and that a great continent barred the way, north as well as south of the equator. Then a famous mapmaker gave the name of America to both continents. But many Spaniards were jealous for the fame of Columbus, and they thought that the northern continent should be called Colonia or Colombiana. One, anxious that the part in the discovery taken by Ferdinand and Isabella should not be forgotten, even tried to make people call it Fair Isabelica. But all such efforts were in vain. America sounded well, people liked it, and soon every one used it. Amerigo Vespucci himself had nothing to do with the choice, and yet because others gave his name to the New World, many hard things have been said of him. He has been called in scorn a landlubber, a beef-and-biscuit contractor, and other contemptuous names. Even one of the greatest American writers has poured scorn on him. Strange, he says, that broad America must wear the name of a thief, Amerigo Vespucci, the pickle-dealer of Seville, whose highest naval rank was a boatswain's mate in an expedition that never sailed, managed in this lying world to supplant Columbus and baptize half the earth in his own dishonest name. But it was the people of his day, and not Vespucci, who brought the new name into use. Vespucci himself had never any intention of being a thief or of robbing Columbus of his glory. He and Columbus had always been friends, and little more than a year before he died Columbus wrote a letter to his son Diego, which Vespucci delivered. In this letter Columbus says, Amerigo Vespucci, the bearer of this letter, has always been wishful to please me. He is a very honest man. He is very anxious to do something for me, if it is in his power. It was only accident which gave the name of America to the New World, and perhaps also the ingratitude of the great leader's own generation. Later generations, however, have not been so unmindful of Columbus and his deeds. Americans have not allowed his great name to be wholly forgotten. The district in which the capital of the United States is situated is called Columbia. In Canada, too, there is the great province of British Columbia, and in South America the United States of Columbia, besides many towns all named in honor of the great discoverer. End of chapter 5. Read on October 16, 2007, in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours, Chapter 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 6. How the Flag of England was Planted on the Shores of the New World. Christopher Columbus showed the way across the Sea of Darkness. Amerigo Vespucci gave his name to the great double continent, but it was another Italian, John Cabot, who first landed on the continent of North America. Like Columbus, Cabot was born in Genoa. When, however, he left his own land, he did not go to Spain like Columbus, but to England. He had been living in England for some years when the news of the first great voyage of Columbus was brought there. Soon every one was talking about the wonderful discovery, from the king and his court downward. Cabot was a trader and a daring sailor, well used to sailing on the stormy seas, yet even he was awed by what Columbus had done. To find that way never known before, and by sailing west to reach the east, where the spices grow, seemed to him a thing more divine than human, and he too longed to follow Columbus and maybe discover new lands. King Henry the Seventh was eager to claim new lands, as the kings of Spain and Portugal were doing, so he listened to the persuasions of John Cabot. And, in spite of the Pope, who had divided all the undiscovered world between the kings of Spain and Portugal, gave him leave to sail forth to the seas of the east and west and north, 
and to plant the banner of England upon any islands, countries, or regions belonging to heathens or infidels which he might discover. He bade his well-beloved John Cabot take five ships and set forth on the adventure, at his own proper costs and charges, for Henry was a king wise but not lavish, and although he wanted England to have the glory of new discoveries, he was not eager to spend his gold on them. But where could a poor sailor find money enough for so great an adventure? So a year went past, and although Cabot had the king's leave to go, he did not set out, but he did not let the king forget. And at length, close-fisted Henry listened to the busy request and supplication of the eager sailor, and consented to fit out one small ship. So at five o'clock, one sweet May morning, a frail little vessel called the Matthew, with a crew of but eighteen men, sailed out from Bristol Harbour. Many people came to see the vessel sail, for they were nearly all Bristol men who were thus venturing forth on the unknown deep, and their friends crowded to the harbour to wish them Godspeed. It was a great occasion for Bristol, and indeed for all England, for it was the first voyage of discovery with which the English king and people had to do. So the tiny white-sailed ship put out to sea, followed by the prayers and wishes of those left behind. With tear-dimmed eyes they watched it till it faded from view. Then they turned homewards to pray for the return of their loved ones. Round the coast of Ireland the vessel sped, but at last its green shores faded from sight, and the little company of eighteen brave men were alone upon the trackless waves. Westward and ever westward they sailed, over the hazy distance, beyond the sunset's rim. Week after week went by, six weeks, and then seven, and still no land appeared. Those were days of anxiety and gloom, but still the hope of the golden west lured Cabot on, and at length one day in June he heard the glad cry of, "'Land! Land!' So, on St. John's Day in 1497, John Cabot landed somewhere on the coast of America. He called the land Prima Tierra Vista, or First Land Seen, and because of the day upon which it was found he called an island near to it St. John's Isle. We cannot tell exactly where Cabot cast anchor. It may have been at Cape Breton, or somewhere on the coast of Labrador. But wherever it was that he landed, he there set up a great cross, and unfurled the flag of England, claiming the land for King Henry. When Cabot set out, he was full of the ideas of Columbus. He had hoped to find himself on the coast of Asia, and in the land of gold and spices. Now he knew himself mistaken. He did not see any natives, but he knew the land was inhabited, for he found notched trees, snares for wild animals, and other signs of habitation which he took home. He had found no golden cities, he had had speech with no stately potentate, yet he was not utterly disappointed, for the country he had found seemed to him fair and fertile, and the quantities of fish which swarmed in the seas amazed both himself and his men. They had no need of lines, or even of nets, they had but to let down a basket weighted with a stone, and draw it up again, to have all the fish they wanted. Cabot stayed but a short time in the new found land. He would fain have stayed longer, and explored further, but he feared lest his provisions would give out, and so regretfully he turned homeward. Great was the excitement in Bristol when the tiny ship came to anchor there once more, little more than three months after it had sailed away. And so strange were the tales Master Cabot had to tell, that the folk of Bristol would hardly have believed him, for he was a poor man and a foreigner, had not his crew of honest Bristol men vouched for the truth of all he said. Every one was delighted. Even thrifty King Henry was so much pleased that he gave Cabot ten pounds. It seems a small enough sum for one who had found a new isle, but we must remember that it was worth more than a hundred pounds would be worth to-day. Cabot, at any rate, found it enough with which to buy a suit of silk, and, dressed in this new splendour, he walked about the streets of Bristol, followed by gaping crowds. He was now called the Great Admiral, and much honour was paid to him. Every one was eager to talk with him, eager to go with him on his next voyage, and that even although they knew that many of the crew would be thieves and evildoers for the king had promised to give Cabot for sailors all prisoners except those who were confined for high treason. 
we know little more of John Cabot. Later King Henry gave him a pension of twenty pounds a year. It seems likely that the following year he set out again across the broad Atlantic, taking his sons with him. The rest is silence. How John Cabot ended his life, where he lies taking his rest, we do not know. He sleeps somewhere in sod unknown, without a slab, without a stone. We remember him chiefly because he was the first to lead Englishmen across the Atlantic, the first to plant the flag of England upon the continent of North America, which, in days to come, was to be the home of two great English-speaking peoples. End of chapter 6 Read on October 17, 2007, in Oceanside, California This Country of Ours, Chapter 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This Country of Ours, by H. E. Marshall, Chapter 7. How the Flag of France was Planted in Florida. As years went on, many voyages of discovery and exploration were made to the New World, by both the Spaniards and the Portuguese, but chiefly by the Spaniards. America was the land of golden hopes, the land of splendid adventure, and the haughty knights of Spain, thirsting for gold and for fame, were lured thither. They sought the fabled seven cities of gold, they sought the fountain of eternal youth. Through the dark pathless forests, across the wide prairies, they flashed in glittering array, awaking the vast silences with the clash of arms. They came in all the pomp and splendour of warfare. They brought also the cross of Christ, threatening the heathen with death if they did not bow to him and be baptised. And it seemed for a time as if they, and they only, would possess the vast continent. But expedition after expedition ended in disaster." the Spaniards found neither the far-famed seven cities nor the fountain of youth, and the red men, instead of accepting their religion, hated them and it with a deep hatred. But the Spaniards were not long left in undisputed possession of America. The French king, too, desired to have new lands across the seas, and he saw no reason why Spain and Portugal should divide the new world between them. "'I would fain see Father Adam's will,' he said, in which he made you the sole heirs to so vast an inheritance. Until I do see that, I shall seize as mine whatever my good ships may find upon the ocean. From France, therefore, daring men sailed forth to the new world, and there they set up the arms of their country, claiming broad lands for their king. And now came the time when all Christian lands were torn asunder by religious strife. The Reformation had begun, and everywhere there was discord between the people who followed the old religion and those who followed the new. In France those who followed the new religion were called Huguenots. They were often hardly used, and were denied freedom to worship God in their own way. Many of them therefore longed to get away from France and go to some new country where they would have the freedom they desired. So a few grave, stern men gathered together, and determined to set out for some place in the new world where they might make a home. Then one February day in 1562 two little ships sailed away from France. Westward they sailed until about two and a half months later they landed in what is now Florida. It was May Day, the sun shone, and all the world seemed gay and green, and these Protestant adventurers thought they had never seen so fair a land. It was, they said, the fairest, fruitfulest, and pleasantest of all the world, abounding in honey, venison, and wildfowl. The natives were friendly, and told the newcomers by signs that the seven golden cities were not far off. That rejoiced their hearts, for even those stern old Huguenots were not above following the quest for gold. Here, then, in this far-off land, the Huguenots set up a stone pillar carved with the arms of the King of France, and, kneeling round it, they gave thanks to God for having brought them to so fair a country. 
Then, returning to their ships, they sailed northward along the coast. For they had not come to settle, but merely to explore, and find out a good spot on which to found a colony. But the land seemed so fair, the air so balmy, that they were ready to settle there at once, and never return to France. At length, after inspecting several places, the adventurers reached a spot not far from what is now Beaufort, in South Carolina. Here they landed, and knowing that many of the men were already eager to remain in this beautiful country, Jean Ribot, their leader, resolved to found a colony. So he called them all together, and, speaking wise and brave words to them, asked who among them would remain. "'Declare your minds freely unto me,' he said, "'and remember that if you decide to remain you will for ever be famous, and be known as the first white men who inhabited this land.' Ribot had scarcely finished speaking when nearly all the men replied with a shout, "'We ask nothing better than to remain in this beautiful country.' Indeed, so many were anxious to remain that Ribot had enough to do to persuade a sufficient number to man the ships to return with him. In the end thirty men were chosen to remain. At once they set about building a fort, which they called Charles Fort, in honour of the boy king Charles the Ninth, who was then upon the throne.' The men worked so well that in a very few days the fort was so far finished that it was fit to live in. Food and ammunition were brought from the ships, and a man named Albert de la Pierria was chosen as governor. Then for the last time Ribot gathered all the men together and took leave of those to be left behind. "'Captain Albert,' he said, "'I have to ask you, in the presence of all these men, to quit yourself so wisely in your charge that I shall be able to commend you to your king.' "'And you,' he said, turning to the soldiers, "'I beg you to esteem Captain Albert as if he were myself, "'and to yield to him that obedience that a true soldier owes to his general and captain. "'I pray you live as brethren together without discord, "'and in so doing God will assist you, and bless your enterprises.' "'Then farewells were said, and Ribot sailed away, "'leaving the thirty white men alone in the wilderness.' From north to south, from east to west, in all the vast continent, there were no white men save themselves. The little company was made up of young nobles, sailors, merchants, and artisans. There were no farmers or peasants among them, and when they had finished their fort, none of them thought of clearing the land and sowing corn. There was no need. Ribot would soon return, they thought, bringing with him all they required. So they made friends with the Indians, and roamed the forest wilds, in search of gold and of adventures, without care for the future. But the days and weeks passed, and Ribot did not return, for when he arrived home he found that France was torn with civil war, and that it was impossible to get ships fitted out to sail to America. Soon the little colony began to feel the pangs of hunger. Daily they scanned the pitiless blue sea for a glimpse of Ribot's returning sail, no sail appeared, and daily their supplies dwindled away. Had it not been for the friendly red men they might all have perished, for the Indians were generous, and as long as they had food themselves they shared it with their white friends. But at length they could spare no more. Indeed they had already given the pale faces so much food that they themselves, they said, would be forced to roam the woods in search of roots and herbs to keep them from starving until harvest was ripe. They told the Frenchmen, however, of two rich and powerful chiefs, who held sway over land which lay to the south, where they might obtain endless supplies of corn and vegetables. This was indeed good news to the Frenchmen, and, guided by their Indian friends, they lost no time in setting out to beg food from those dusky potentates. When the Frenchmen reached the wigwams of one of these chiefs, they were received with great honour. They found that their redskin friends had spoken truly— here there was food in abundance, and after a great feast they returned joyfully to the fort, carrying with them a great supply of corn and beans, and, what was still better, a promise from the friendly chief that he would give them more food whenever they had need of it. Once more the colonists rejoiced in plenty, but not for long, for the very night they arrived home their storehouse took fire, and all the food which they had brought with such joy was destroyed." Again famine stared them in the face. In their plight they once more appealed to the savage chief who supplied their wants as generously as before, 
promising them that as long as his meal should last they should never want. So for the time being the colonists were saved from starvation. But another danger now threatened them, for quarrels arose among the men. Albert de Pieria, who had been set over them as captain, proved to be cruel and despotic. He oppressed the men in many ways, hanging and imprisoning at will those who displeased him. Soon the men began to murmur under his tyranny. Black looks greeted Albert de Pieria. He answered them with blacker deeds. At length one day for some misdeed he banished a soldier to a lonely island, and left him there to die of hunger. This was more than the colonists could well bear. Their smouldering anger burst forth, and seizing the tyrant they put him to death. Then they chose one of their number, called Nicholas Barr, to be their captain. They were rid of their tyrant, and that brought peace for a time to the little colony. But the men had grown to hate the place. The land which had once seemed to them so fair now seemed no better than a prison, and they longed to escape from it. They had, however, no ship, and although all around them tall trees grew, no one of them knew anything of shipbuilding. Still, so strong was their desire to leave the hated spot, that they resolved to build one. They set to work with a will. Soon the sound of saw and hammer awoke the silence of the forest. High and low, noble and peasant, all worked together, the Indians even lending a hand. At length their labours were over, and the rough little ship was afloat. It made but a sorry appearance. The planks were rough-hewn by the hatchet, and caulked with the moss which grew in long streamers on the trees. The cordage was Indian-made, and the sails were patched together from shirts and bedclothes. Never before had men thought to dare the ocean waves in so crazy a craft, but the colonists were in such eagerness to be gone that they chose rather to risk almost certain death upon the ocean than remain longer in their vast prison-house. So they loaded the ship with as much food as they could collect, and, saying farewell to their Indian friends, they spread their patchwork sails, and glided out to sea, drunken with joy at the thought of returning to France. At first the wind blew fair, and the little ship sped gaily homeward. Then came a calm. The sun burned overhead, no faintest breeze stirred the slack sails, and the ship lay as if at anchor upon the glassy waters. And as the ship lay motionless, the slender stock of food grew less and less. Soon there was nothing left but maize, and little of that. At first a tiny handful was each man's daily portion. Then it was counted by grains. But, jealously hoarded although it was, the maize at length gave out, and there was nothing left to eat but their leather shoes and jerkins. Then to the pain of hunger was added the pain of thirst, for the water-barrels were empty to the last drop. Unable to endure the torture, some drank the sea-water, and so died in madness. Beneath the burning sun every timber of the crazy little ship warped and started, and on all sides the sea flowed in. Still, through all their agony, the men clung to life, and sick with hunger, maddened with thirst as they were, they laboured unceasingly, bailing out the water. But they laboured now with despair in their hearts, and they gave up hope of ever seeing their beloved France again. Then at length the pitiless sun was overcast, a wild wind arose, and the glassy sea, whipped to fury, became a waste of foam and angry billows. The tiny vessel was tossed about helplessly, and buffeted this way and that. In the turning of a hand, says an old writer, the waves filled their vessel half full of water, and bruised it upon one side. The wretched men now gave themselves up for lost. They cared no longer to bail, but cast themselves down into the bottom of the boat, and let it drift where it would. Only one man among them did not utterly lose heart. He set himself now to encourage the others, telling them that if only the wind held, in three days they would see the shores of France. This man was so full of hope that at length he aroused the others from their despair. Once more they began the weary work of bailing, and in spite of all the fury of the wind and waves, the little vessel kept afloat. At last the storm passed. Once more the fainting wanderers righted their vessel, and turned the prow towards the shores of France. But three days passed, and no land was seen, and they became more despairing than before. For now the last grain of corn was eaten, the last drop of water drunk. 
Mad with thirst, sick with hunger, the men strained their weary eyes over the rolling waste of waters. No land was in sight. Then a terrible thought crept into one mind after another. In a low, hoarse whisper, one man, and then another, spoke out his thought. That one man should die for his fellows. So deep were they sunk in woe that all were of one mind, so lots were cast, and the man upon whom the lot fell was killed. These tortured wayfarers had become cannibals. Kept alive in this terrible fashion, the men sailed on, and at length a faint grey streak appeared on the horizon. It was the long looked for shore of France, but the joy was too great for their overstrained minds. The sight of land seemed to rob them of all power of thought or action. With salvation in sight, they let the little vessel drift aimlessly this way and that. While they thus drifted aimlessly, a white sail hove in sight, and an English vessel bore down upon them. In the English vessel there happened to be a Frenchman who had sailed with Ribot on his first voyage to Florida. He soon recognized his countrymen in spite of their sorry plight, and they were brought aboard the English vessel and when they had been given food and drink, and were somewhat revived, they told their tale of misery. The Englishmen were in doubt for some time as to what it was best to do. In the end, they decided to set the most feeble on the shores of France, and to carry the others prisoners to the Queen of England, who at that time was about to send an expedition to Florida. So ended the first attempt of the French to found a colony in North America. End of chapter 7. Read on October 19th, 2007, in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours. Chapter 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours. CHAPTER Eight, HOW THE FRENCH FOUNDED A COLONY IN FLORIDA Two years after Ribot's ill-fated expedition, another company of Frenchmen set sail for America. This time René de Laudonniere was captain. He had been with Ribot two years before, and now again he landed on the same spot where Ribot had first landed, and set up the arms of France. As they saw his ship come, the Indians ran down to the beach, welcoming him with cries of excitement and joy, and, taking him by the hand, the chief led him to the pillar which Jean Ribot had set up. It was wreathed in flowers, and baskets of corn stood before it. For the Indians looked upon it as an idol, and made offerings to it. They kissed it with a great show of reverence, and begged the Frenchmen to do the same. "'Which we would not deny them,' says Laudonniere, who himself tells the story." to the end we might draw them to be more in friendship with us. Laudonniere was so delighted with the natives' friendly greeting that he resolved to found his colony among these kindly Indians. So a little way up the river which Ribot had named the River of May, but which is now the St. John's, he built a fort. It was late one evening in June when the Frenchmen reached the spot where they intended to build the fort. Wearied with their long march through the forest, they lay down upon the ground and were soon fast asleep. But at daybreak Laudonniere was astir. He commanded a trumpet to be sounded, and when all the men were aroused and stood together he bade them give thanks to God for their safe arrival. So, standing beneath the waving palms, with the deep blue sky arching overhead, the men sang a psalm of thanksgiving and praise. Then, kneeling, they prayed long and earnestly. The prayer ended. The men arose, and, full of happy courage, turned to their work. Every one took part with right good will. Some brought earth, some cut logs. There was not a man who had not a shovel or hatchet or some tool in his hand. The work went on merrily, and soon above the banks of the river the fort rose, secure and strong, fenced and entrenched on every side. In honour of their King Charles, these new colonists called their fort Caroline, just as Ribot had called his Charles Fort. But as the native chief Saturiona watched the fort grow, he began to be uneasy. He wondered what these pale-faced strangers were about, and he feared lest they should mean evil towards him. So he gathered his warriors together, 
and one day the Frenchmen looked up from their labours to see the heights above them thick with savages in their war-paint. At once the Frenchmen dropped their tools and prepared to defend themselves, but Saturiona, making signs of peace, and leaving most of his warriors behind him, came down into the camp followed by a band of twenty musicians, who blew ear-piercing blasts upon discordant pipes. Having reached the camp, Saturiona squatted on his haunches, showing that he wanted to take counsel with the Frenchmen. Then, with many signs and gestures, he told the Frenchmen that his great enemies, the Themagos, were near, and that if the Frenchmen wished to continue in friendship with him, they must promise to help him against these powerful and hated foes. Laudonniere feared to lose Saturiona's friendship, and thereupon, with signs, helped out now and again with a word or two, a treaty was made between the Indians and the Frenchmen, Laudonniere promising to help Saturiona against his enemies, the Thimagos. With this treaty Saturiona was delighted, and he commanded his warriors to help the Frenchmen in building their fort, which they very readily did. Then, mindful of his promise, as soon as the fort was finished, Laudonniere sent off some of his followers under one of his officers, to find out who the Thimagos really were, of whom Saturiona spoke with such hate. Guided by some Indians, this officer soon came upon the Thimagos, but instead of fighting with them he made friends with them, which greatly disgusted his Indian guides. Meanwhile Saturiona, delighted at the idea of being able to crush his enemies with the Frenchmen's help, had gathered all his braves together, and made ready for war. Ten chiefs and five hundred warriors, fearful in war-paint and feathers, gathered at the call. Then, seeing that Laudonniere was not making any preparations for war, he sent messengers to him. "'Our chief has sent us,' they said, "'and he would know whether you will stand by your promise to show yourself a friend of his friends, an enemy of his enemies, and go with him to war.' "'Tell your chief,' replied Laudonniere, "'that I am not willing to purchase his friendship with the enmity of another. Notwithstanding, I will go with him, but first I must gather food for my garrison, neither are my ships ready.' An enterprise such as this needs time. Let your chief abide two months, then if he hold himself ready I will fulfil my promise to him. The Indian carried this answer to the chief, who, when he heard it, was filled with wrath. He was not, however, to be stayed from war, and he determined to go alone. With great ceremony he prepared to set out. In an open space near the river a huge fire was lit. In a wide circle round this the warriors gathered. Their faces were fearful with paint, and their hair was decorated with feathers, or the heads of wolves and bears and other fierce animals. Beside the fire was placed a large bowl of water, and near it Saturiona stood erect, while his braves squatted at his feet. Standing thus he turned his face, distorted with wrath and hatred, towards the enemy's country. First he muttered to himself, then he cried aloud to his god the sun, and when he had done this for half an hour he put his hand into the bowl of water, and sprinkled the heads of his braves. Then suddenly, as if in anger, he cast the rest of the water into the fire, putting it out. As he did so he cried aloud, "'So may the blood of our enemies be poured out, and their lives extinguished!' In reply a hoarse yell went up from the savage host, and all the woods resounded with the fiendish noise." Thus Saturiona and his braves set forth for battle. In a few days they returned, singing praises to the sun, and bringing with them twenty-four prisoners, and many scalps. And now Laudonniere made Saturiona more angry than ever with him, for he demanded two of these prisoners. Laudonniere wanted them so that he might send them back to the chief of the Thimagos as a proof that he, at least, was still friendly, for he already regretted his unwise treaty. But when Saturiona heard Laudonniere's request, he was very angry, and treated it with scorn. "'Tell your chief,' he said, "'that he has broken his oath, and I will not give him any of my prisoners.' When Laudonniere heard this answer, he in his turn was very angry, and he resolved to frighten Saturiona into obeying him. So, taking twenty soldiers with him, he went to the chief's village. Leaving some of the soldiers at the gate, and charging them to let no Indians go in or out, he went into Saturiona's hut with the others. In perfect silence he came in, in perfect silence he sat down, and remained so for a long time, which, says Laudonniere, put the chief deeply in the dumps. 
At length, when he thought that Satoriana was completely frightened, Laudonnière spoke. "'Where are your prisoners?' he said. "'I command them to be brought before me.' Thereupon the chief, angry at the heart, and astonished wonderfully, stood for a long time without making any answer. But when at last he spoke it was boldly and without fear. "'I cannot give you my prisoners,' he said, "'for seeing you coming in such warlike guise they were afraid, and fled to the woods.' and not knowing what way they went, we could not by any means find them again. Laudonnière, however, pretended that he did not understand what the chief said, and again he asked for the prisoners. The chief then commanded his son to go in search of them, and in about an hour he returned, bringing them with him. As soon as they were brought before Laudonnière, the prisoners greeted him humbly. They lifted up their hands to heaven, and then threw themselves at his feet, but Laudonnière raised them at once and led them away to the fort, leaving Saturiona very angry. Laudonnière now sent the prisoners back to the Thimago's chief, who was greatly delighted at the return of his braves. He was still more delighted when the Frenchmen marched with him against another tribe, who were his enemies, and defeated them. But while Laudonnière was thus making both friends and enemies among the Indians, all was not peace in the colony itself. Many of the adventurers had grown tired of the loneliness and sameness of the life, the food was bad, the work was hard, and there seemed little hope that things would ever be better. And for all their hardships it seemed to them the governor was to blame, so they began to murmur and be discontented, gathering together in groups, whispering that it would be a good deed to put an end to Laudonnière and choose another captain. And now, when the discontent was at its height, Laudonnière fell ill. Then one of the ringleaders of the discontent urged the doctor to put poison in his medicine, but the doctor refused. Next they formed a plot to hide a barrel of gunpowder under his bed and blow him up, but Laudonnière discovered that plot, and the ringleader fled to the forest. About this time a ship arrived from France bringing food for the colony, so that for a time things went a little better. And when the ship sailed again for home, Laudonnière sent the worst of the mutineers back in it. In their place the captain left behind some of his sailors, but this proved a bad exchange, for these sailors were little better than pirates, and very soon they became the ringleaders in revolt. They persuaded some of the older colonists to join them, and one day they stole a little ship belonging to the colony, and set off on a plundering expedition to the West Indies. On the seas they led a wild and lawless life, taking and plundering Spanish ships but after a time they ran short of food and found themselves forced to put into a Spanish port. Here, in order to make peace with the Spaniards, they told all they knew about the French colony. Thus it was that for the first time the Spaniards learned that the heretic Frenchmen had settled in their land, and speedily the news was sent home to Spain. Meanwhile, Laudonnière was greatly grieved for the loss of his ship, and as days passed, and there was no sign of the mutineers' return, he set his men to work to build two new ships. For a time the work went well, but soon many of the men grew tired of it, and they began to grumble. "'Why should men of noble birth?' they asked. "'Slave like carpenters!' And day by day the discontent increased. At last, one Sunday morning, the men sent a message to Laudonnière, asking him to come out to the parade-ground to meet them. Laudonnière went, and he found all the colony waiting for him with gloomy faces. At once one of them stepped forward, and asked leave to read a paper in the name of all the others. Laudonnière gave permission. The paper was read. It was full of complaints about the hard work, the want of food, and other grievances. It ended with a request that the men should be allowed to take the two ships which were being built, and sail to Spanish possessions in search of food. In fact, they wanted to become pirates, like those mutineers who had already sailed away. Laudonnière refused to listen to this request, but he promised that as soon as the two ships were finished they should be allowed to set out in search of gold mines. The mutineers separated with gloomy faces. They were by no means satisfied with Laudonnière's answer, and the discontent was as deep as ever. Laudonnière now again became very ill, and the malcontents had it all their own way. Soon nearly every one in the fort was on their side, and they resolved to put an end to Laudonnière's tyranny. Late one night about twenty men, all armed to the teeth, gathered together and marched to Laudonnière's hut. Arrived there, they beat loudly on the door, demanding entrance, 
but Laudonniere and his few remaining friends knew well what this loud summons meant, and they refused to open the door. The mutineers, however, were not to be easily held back. They forced open the door, wounding one man who tried to hinder them, and in a few minutes, with drawn swords in hand, and angry scowls on their faces, they crowded round the sick man's bed. Then, holding a gun at his throat, they commanded him to give them leave to set forth for Spanish waters. But the stern old Huguenot knew no fear. Even with the muzzle of a gun against his throat, he refused to listen to the demands of the lawless crew. His calmness drove them to fury. With terrible threats, and more terrible oaths, they dragged him from his bed. Loading him with fetters, they carried him out of the fort, threw him into a boat, and rowed him out to the ship which lay anchored in the river. All the loyal colonists had by this time been disarmed, and the fort was completely in the hands of the mutineers. Their leader then drew up a paper giving them leave to set forth to Spanish possessions, and this he commanded Laudonniere to sign. Laudonniere was completely in the power of the mutineers. He was a prisoner, and ill, but his spirit was unbroken, and he refused to sign. Then the mutineers sent him a message, saying that if he did not sign, they would come on board the ship and cut his throat. So, seeing no help for it, Laudonniere signed. The mutineers were now greatly delighted at the success of their schemes. They made haste to finish the two little ships which they had been building, and on the 8th of December they set sail. As they went they flung taunts at those who stayed behind, calling them fools and dolts, and other scornful names, and threatening them with all manner of punishments, should they refuse them free entrance to the fort on their return. As soon as the mutineers were gone, Laudonniere's friends rode out to him, set him free from his fetters, and brought him back to the colony. They were now but a very small company, but they were at peace with each other, and there was plenty to do. So the weeks went quickly by. They finished the fort, and began to build two new ships to take the place of those which the mutineers had stolen. But they never thought of tilling the ground and sowing seed to provide bread for the future. Thus more than three months passed. Then one day an Indian brought the news that a strange ship was in sight. Laudonniere at once sent some men to find out what ship this might be, and whether it was friend or foe. It proved to be a Spanish vessel, which the mutineers had captured and which was now manned by them. But the mutineers, who had sailed away full of pride and insolence, now returned in very humble mood. Their buccaneering had not succeeded as they had hoped. They were starving, and instead of boldly demanding entrance and putting in force their haughty threats, they were eager to make terms. But Laudonniere was not sure whether they really came in peace or not. So he sent out a little boat to the mutineer's ship. On the deck of it there was an officer with one or two men only. But below, thirty men, all armed to the teeth, were hidden. Seeing only these one or two men in the boat, the mutineers let her come alongside. But what was their astonishment when armed men suddenly sprang from the bottom of the boat and swarmed over the sides of their vessel? Many of the mutineers were stupid with drink, all of them were weak with hunger, and before they could seize their arms or make any resistance, they were overpowered and carried ashore. There a court-martial was held, and four of the ringleaders were condemned to death, but these bold bad men were loath to die. Comrades, said one, turning to the loyal soldiers near, will you stand by and see us die thus shamefully? These, replied Laudonniere sharply, are no comrades of mutineers and rebels. All appeals for mercy were in vain, so the men were shot and their bodies hanged on gibbets near the mouth of the river, as a lesson to rebels. After this there was peace for a time in Fort Caroline, but it soon became peace with misery, for the colony began to starve. The long-expected ship from France did not come. Rich and fertile land spread all round them, but the colonists had neither ploughed nor sown it. They trusted to France for all their food. Now for months no ships had come, and their supplies were utterly at an end. So, in ever-increasing misery, the days passed. Some crawled about the meadows and forest, digging for roots and gathering herbs. Others haunted the river-bed in search of shellfish. One man even gathered up all the fish-bones he could find, and ground them to powder to make bread. But all that they scraped together with so much pain and care was hardly enough to keep body and soul together. They grew so thin that their bones started through the skin. 
gaunt, hollow-eyed spectres, they lay about the fort sunk in misery, or dragged themselves a little way into the forest in search of food. Unless help came from France, they knew that they must all soon die a miserable death, and amid all their misery they clung to that last hope that help would come from France. So, however feeble they were, however faint with hunger, they would crawl in turns to the top of the hill above the fort, straining their dimming eyes seaward. But no sail appeared. At length they gave up all hope, and determined to leave the hated spot. They had the Spanish ship which the mutineers had captured, and another little vessel besides which they had built. But these were not enough to carry them all to France, so gathering all their last energy they began to build another boat. The hope of getting back to France seemed for a time to put a little strength into their famine-stricken bodies, and while they worked Laudonnière sailed up the river in search of food, but he returned empty-handed. Famishing men cannot work, and soon the colonists began to weary of their labours. The neighbouring Indians, too, who might have given them food, were now their enemies. They indeed now and again brought scant supplies of fish to the starving men, but they demanded so much for it that soon the colonists were bare of everything they had possessed. They bartered the very shirts from their backs for food, and if they complained of the heavy price, the Indians laughed at them. "'If thou makest so great a count of thy merchandise,' they jeered, "'eat it, and we will eat our fish.' But the summer passed. The grain began to ripen, and although the Indians sold it grudgingly, the colony was relieved from utter misery for the time being." But now fresh troubles arose, for the Frenchmen quarrelled with the thief of the Thimagos, for whose sake they had already made enemies of Saturiona and his Indians. Thinking themselves treated in an unfriendly manner by the Thimagos, the Frenchmen seized their chief and kept him prisoner until the Indians promised to pay a ransom of large quantities of grain. The Indians agreed only because they saw no other means of freeing their chief. They were furiously angry with the Frenchmen, and, seething with indignation against them, they refused to pay an ounce of grain until their chief had been set free, and even then they would not bring it to Fort Caroline, but forced the Frenchmen to come for it. The Frenchmen went, but they very quickly saw that they were in great danger, for the village swarmed with armed warriors, who greeted the colonists with scowls of deepest hatred. After a few days, therefore, although only a small portion of the ransom had been paid, the Frenchmen decided to make for home, as fast as possible. It was a hot July morning on which they set off. Each man, besides his gun, carried a sack of grain, so the progress was slow. They had not gone far beyond the village when a wild war-whoop was heard. It was immediately followed by a shower of arrows. The Frenchmen replied with a hot fire of bullets— Several of the Indians fell dead, and the rest fled howling into the forest. Then the Frenchmen marched on again. But they had scarcely gone a quarter of a mile when another war-whoop was heard in front. It was answered from behind, and the Frenchmen knew themselves surrounded, but they stood their ground bravely. Dropping their bags of corn, they seized their guns. A sharp encounter followed, and soon the Indians fled again into the forest. But again and again they returned to the attack— and the Frenchmen had to fight every yard of the way. At nine o'clock the fight began, and the sun was setting when at length the Indians gave up the pursuit. When the Frenchmen reached their boats they counted their losses. Two had been killed, and twenty-two injured, some of them so badly that they had to be carried on board the boats. Of all the bags of grain with which they had started out, only two remained. It was a miserable ending to the expedition." The plight of the colony was now worse than ever. The two sacks of grain were soon consumed. The feeble efforts at building a ship had come to nothing. But rather than stay longer, the colonists resolved to crowd into the two small vessels they had, and sail homeward, if only they could gather food enough for the voyage. But where to get that food none knew. One day, full of troubled, anxious thoughts, Laudonnière climbed the hill and looked seaward. Suddenly he saw something which made his heart beat fast, and brought the colour to his wasted cheeks. A great ship, its sails gleaming white in the sunlight, was making for the mouth of the river. As he gazed, another and still another ship hove in sight. Thrilling with excitement, Laudonnière sent a messenger down to the fort, with all speed, to tell the news, and when they heard it the men who had seemed scarce able to crawl, arose and danced for joy. 
They laughed and wept and cried aloud, till it seemed as if joy had bereft them of their wits. But soon fear mingled with their joy. There was something not altogether familiar about the cut and rig of the ships. Were they really the long-looked-for ships from France, or did they belong to their deadly and hated enemies, the Spaniards? They were neither one nor the other. That little fleet was English, under command of the famous Admiral John Hawkins, in search of fresh water, of which they stood much in need. The English Admiral at once showed himself friendly. To prove that he came with no evil intent, he landed with many of his officers gaily clad, and wearing no arms. The famine-stricken colonists hailed him with delight, for it seemed to them that he came as a deliverer. Gravely and kindly Hawkins listened to the tale of misery, yet he was glad enough when he heard that the Frenchmen had decided to leave Florida, for he wanted to claim it for Queen Elizabeth and England. When, however, he saw the ships in which they meant to sail homewards, he shook his head. It was not possible, he said, for so many souls to cross the broad Atlantic in those tiny barks. So he offered to give all the Frenchmen a free passage to France in his own ships. This Laudonnière refused. Then Hawkins offered to lend him or sell him one of his ships. Even this kindness Laudonnière hesitated to accept. Thereupon there arose a great uproar among the colonists. They crowded round him, clamouring to be gone, threatening that if he refused the Englishman's offer they would accept it and sail without him. So Laudonnière yielded. He told Hawkins that he would buy the ship he offered, but he had no money. The Englishman, however, was generous. Instead of money he took the cannon, and other things now useless to the colonists. He provided them with food enough for the voyage, and seeing many of the men ragged and barefoot, added, among other things, fifty pairs of shoes. Then, with kindly good wishes, Hawkins said farewell and sailed away, leaving behind him many grateful hearts. As soon as he was gone the Frenchmen began to prepare to depart also. In a few days all was ready, and they only waited for a fair wind in order to set sail. But as they waited, one day, the fort was again thrown into a state of excitement by the appearance of another fleet of ships. Again the question was asked, were they friends or foes, Spaniards or Frenchmen? At length, after hours of sickening suspense, the question was answered, they were Frenchmen, under the command of Ribot. The long-looked-for help had come at last. It had come when it was no longer looked for, when it was indeed unwelcome to many, for the colonists had grown utterly weary of that sunlit, cruel land, and they only longed to go home. France, with any amount of tyranny, was to be preferred before the freedom and the misery of Florida. But to abandon the colony was now impossible for besides supplies of food the French ships had brought many new colonists. This time, too, the men had not come alone, but had brought their wives and families with them. Soon the fort which had been so silent and mournful was filled with sounds of talk and laughter. Again the noise of hatchet and hammer resounded through the woods, and the little forsaken corner of the world awoke once more to life. End of chapter 8 Read on October twentieth, two 2007 in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours, Chapter 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours, by H. E. Marshall, Chapter 9. HOW THE SPANIARDS DROVE THE FRENCH OUT OF FLORIDA Scarcely a week had passed before the new peace and happiness of the French colony was brought to a cruel end. Late one night the men on board the French ships saw a great black hulk loom silently up out of the darkness. It was followed by another and another. No word was spoken, and in eerie silence the strange ships crept stealthily onwards and cast anchor beside the French the stillness grew terrible. At length it was broken by a trumpet call from the deck of one of the silent newcomers. Then a voice came through the darkness. Gentlemen, it asked, whence does this fleet come? From France, was the reply. What are you doing here? was the next question. 
"'We are bringing soldiers and supplies for a fort "'which the King of France has in this country, "'and for many which he soon will have. "'Are you Catholics or Lutherans?' "'The question came sharply across the dark water. "'It was answered by many voices. "'We are Lutherans,' cried the French. "'We are of the new religion.' Then it was the Frenchman's turn to ask questions. "'Who are you?' they cried. "'And whence come ye?' "'I am Pedro Menendez,' replied the voice out of the darkness. "'I am admiral of the fleet of the King of Spain, "'and I am come into this country to hang and behead "'all Lutherans whom I may find by land or by sea. "'And my king has given me such strict commands "'that I have power to pardon no man of them.' and these commands I shall obey to the letter, as you will see. At dawn I shall come aboard your ship, and if there I find any Catholic he shall be well treated, but every heretic shall die. In reply to this speech a shout of wrath went up from the Frenchmen. If you are a brave man, they cried, why wait for dawn? Come on now and see what you will get. Then in their anger they heaped insults upon the Spaniards, and poured forth torrents of scoffing words. Thereupon Menendez was so enraged that he swore to silence those Lutheran dogs once and for ever. So the order was given, and his great ship slowly moved towards the French. The threats of the French had been but idle boasting. They could not withstand the Spaniards, for their leader was ashore with most of his soldiers. So, cutting their cables, they fled out to sea, pursued by the foe. There was a mad chase through the darkness, but the heretic devils, as the Spaniards called them, were skilful sailors. Menendez could not catch them, and when day dawned he gave up the chase, and moodily turned back to Fort Caroline. Here he found the French ready for him, and they seemed so strong that he would not attack, but sailed away southwards until he reached the River of Dolphins. Here Menendez landed and took possession of the country in the name of the King of Spain. While cannon boomed and trumpets blew, he stepped on shore, followed by his officers and gentlemen. In all the gay trappings of knighthood, with many-coloured banners fluttering in the breeze, they marched. Then, as they advanced, another procession came toward them. At the head of it was a priest, in all the pomp and splendour of his priestly robes. He carried a gilded crucifix in his hand, and as he marched he sang a Te Deum. When the two processions met, Menendez and all his company knelt, and bearing their heads kissed the crucifix. So was the land claimed for Spain and the Catholic faith, and St. Augustine, the oldest town in the United States, was founded. Meanwhile, the fleeing French ships had turned, followed the Spaniards, and seen them land, then they went back to Fort Caroline with the news. While these things had been happening, Laudonniere had been very ill. He was still in bed when Ribot, followed by several of his chief officers, came to his room to tell him the news which the returning ships had just brought. And beside his sickbed they held a council of war. It was decided to attack the Spaniards and drive them from the land, but how? First one plan, and then another was discussed, and to each some one objected. But at length it was decided to go by sea and attack the Spaniards suddenly in their newly founded fort. So almost every man who could hold a gun set forth with Ribot, and Laudonniere was left in the fort with the feeble and sick, and scarcely a man besides who had ever drawn a sword or fired a shot. Their leader was as sick and feeble as any of them, but he dragged himself from his bed to review his forces. They were poor indeed, but Laudonniere made the best of them. He appointed each man to a certain duty, he set a watch night and day, and he began to repair the broken-down walls of the fort, so that they would be able to make some show of resistance in case of attack. While Laudonniere was thus ordering his poor little garrison, the ships carrying the rest of the colonists, sailed on their way. The wind was fair, and in the night they crept close to where the Spanish vessels lay. But when day dawned and the Spaniards saw the French vessels close to them, they fled to the shelter of their harbour, and a sudden storm arising, the French were driven out to sea again. As Menendez watched them from the shore, he rejoiced. He knew by the number of ships that most of the French colonists must be in them, and he hoped that they would all be lost in the storm. Then as he watched, a sudden thought came to him. While the Frenchmen were battling with wind and waves, 
he resolved to move quickly over land and take Fort Caroline, for he knew that it must be almost, if not quite, unprotected. One of the French mutineers who had deserted Laudonniere was now in the Spanish fort. He would show the way. Full of this splendid idea, eager to carry it out at once, he ordered mass to be said, then he called a council and laid his plan before his officers. They, however, met his eagerness with coldness. It was a mad and hopeless plan, they thought, and they did their best to dissuade Menendez from it. But Menendez was determined to go. Comrades, he said, it is now that we must show our courage and our zeal. This is God's war, and we must not turn our backs upon it. It is war against heretics, and we must wage it with blood and with fire. But the Spanish leader's eager words awoke no response in the heart of his hearers. They answered him only with mutterings. Still Menendez insisted. The debate grew stormy, and angry words were flung this way and that. At length, however, Menendez had his way. The clamour was stilled, the officers gave a grudging consent, and preparations for the march were begun. In a few days all was ready, and the expedition set out. It was a simple matter. There was no great train of sumpter mules or baggage wagons. Each man carried his own food and ammunition, and twenty axemen marched in front of the little army to cleave a way through the forest. The storm still raged. Rain fell in torrents, and the wind howled ceaselessly as on and on the men trudged. They plunged through seas of mud and grass which grew waist-high, and threaded their way along the narrow paths cloven for them by the axemen. So for three days they toiled onward. Their food was gone, their ammunition soaked, they were drenched to the skin, foot-sore and famishing, when upon the third night they lay down upon the muddy ground, cursing their leader for having brought them forth to die thus miserably. But while the men cursed, Menendez prayed. All night he prayed, and before day dawned he called his officers to a council. They were now within a mile of Fort Caroline, and he was eager to attack. But his officers were sick of the whole business. The men were utterly disheartened. One and all they clamoured to return. Yet once again Menendez bent them to his will. In the darkness of the forest he spoke to the wretched, shivering, rain-drenched men. He taunted, he persuaded, and at length wrung from them a sullen consent to follow him. So once again the miserable march was begun, and when day dawned they stood on the hill above the fort. No sound came from it, no watchman stood upon the ramparts. For towards morning, seeing that it rained harder than ever, the captain of the guard had sent his men to bed, for they were soaked to the skin, and he was sorry for them. In such rain and wind, what enemy would venture forth, he asked himself. It was folly to stay abroad on such a night, he thought. So he dismissed the guard, and went off to bed. Thus none heard or saw the approach of the Spaniards. Then suddenly the silence of the dawn was broken with fierce war-cries. "'At them!' shouted the Spaniards. "'God is with us!' The sleeping Frenchmen started from their beds in terror. Half-naked they sprang to arms. On every side the Spaniards poured in. The dim light of dawn showed the dark, cruel faces, and the gleam of drawn swords. Then clash of steel, screams of frightened women and children, curses, prayers, all mingled together in terrible confusion. At the first alarm Laudonniere sprang from his bed, and seizing his sword called his men to follow him. But the Spaniards surrounded him, his men were slain and scattered, and he himself was forced back into the yard of his house. Here there was a tent. This stopped his pursuers, for they stumbled over the cordage, and became entangled with it. The confusion gave Laudonniere a few minutes' respite, in which he escaped through a breach in the ramparts, and took refuge in the forest. A few others fleeing this way and that escaped likewise, but some, the first moment of terror past, resolved to return and throw themselves on the mercy of the Spaniards, rather than face starvation in the woods. "'They are men,' said one. "'It may be when their fury is spent they will spare our lives. Even if they slay us, what of that? It is but a moment's pain. Better that than to starve here in the woods, or be torn to pieces by wild beasts.' Still some held back, but most agreed to throw themselves upon the mercy of the Spaniards. So, unarmed and almost naked as they were, they turned back to give themselves up. 
but little did these simple Frenchmen understand the fury of the foe. When they neared the fort the Spaniards rushed out upon them, and, unheeding their cries for mercy, slew them to a man. Those who had held back, when they saw the fate of their companions, fled through the forest. Some sought refuge among the Indians, but even from that refuge the Spaniards hunted them forth and slew them without pity. Thus the land was filled with bloodshed and ruin. Many were slain at once by the sword, others were hanged on trees round the fort, and over them Menendez wrote, I do this not as to Frenchmen, but as to Lutherans. Only a few miserable stragglers, after untold sufferings, reached the little ship which still lay at anchor in the river. Among these was Laudonniere. Their one desire now was to flee homewards, and unfurling their sails they set out for France. The colony of Fort Caroline was wiped out, and rejoicing at the success of his bold scheme, Menendez marched back to St. Augustine, where a te deum was sung in honour of this victory over heretics. Meanwhile the Frenchmen who had set forth to attack St. Augustine by sea had been driven hither and thither by the storm, and at length were wrecked. But although the ships were lost, all, or nearly all, of the men succeeded in reaching the shore in safety, and not knowing what had happened at Fort Caroline, they set out in two companies to try to reach the fort by land. But they never reached the fort. For one morning, scarcely ten days after the destruction of Fort Caroline, some Indians came to Menendez with the news that they had seen a French ship, wrecked a little to the south. The news delighted Menendez, and he at once set out to capture the shipwrecked men. It was not long before he saw the lights of the French camp in the distance, but on coming nearer it was seen that they were on the other side of an arm of the sea, so that it was impossible to reach them. Hiding, therefore, in the bushes by the water's edge, Menendez and his men watched the Frenchmen on the other side. The Spaniards soon saw that their enemies were in distress. They suspected that they were starving, for they could be seen walking up and down the shore seeking shellfish. But Menendez wanted to make sure of the state they were in, and he made up his mind to get nearer to the Frenchmen. So he put off his fine clothes, and, dressing himself like a common sailor, got into a boat, and rowed across the water. Seeing him come, one of the Frenchmen swam out to meet him. As he drew near, Menendez called out to him, "'Who are you, and whence come ye?' "'We are followers of Ribot, viceroy of the King of France,' answered the Frenchman. "'Are you Catholics or Lutherans?' asked Menendez. "'We are Lutherans,' answered the man. Then after a little more talk Menendez told who he was. With this news the man swam back to his companions, but he soon returned to the boat to say that five of the French leaders wished to speak with the Spanish leader, and begged for safe conduct to his camp. To this Menendez readily agreed, and returning to his own side he sent the boat back to bring the French men over. When they landed Menendez received them courteously, and after returning his ceremonious greetings the Frenchmen begged the Spaniards to lend them a boat, so that they might cross the river which lay between them and Fort Caroline. At this request Menendez smiled evilly. "'Gentlemen,' he said, "'it were idle for you to go to your fort. It has been taken, and every man is slain.' But the Frenchmen could not at first believe that he spoke the truth. So in proof of his words the Spanish leader bade his men show the heretics the plunder which had been taken from their fort. As they looked upon it the hearts of the Frenchmen sank." Then, ordering breakfast to be sent to them, Menendez left them, and went to breakfast with his own officers. Breakfast over, he came back to the Frenchmen, and as he looked at their gloomy faces, his heart rejoiced. "'Do you believe now,' he asked, "'that what I told you is true?' "'Yes,' replied the Frenchmen, "'we believe. It would be useless now to go to the fort. All we ask of you is to lend us ships, so that we may return home.' "'I would gladly do so,' replied Menendez, if you were Catholics, and if I had ships. But I have none. Then, seeing that he would give them no help to reach home, the Frenchmen begged Menendez at least to let them stay with his people until help came to them from France. It was little enough to ask, they thought, as France and Spain were at peace. But there was no pity or kindliness in the Spanish general's heart. All Catholics, he replied sternly, I would defend and succour, 
but as for you, you are Lutherans, and I must hold you as enemies. I will wage war against you with blood and fire. I will wage it fiercely, both by land and sea, for I am viceroy for my king in this country. I am here to plant the holy gospel in this land, that the Indians may come to the light and knowledge of the holy Catholic faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, as taught by the Roman Church. Give up your banners and your arms, and throw yourselves on my mercy, and I will do with you as God gives me grace. In no other way can you have truce or friendship with me. To this the Frenchmen knew not what to say. First they consulted together, then some of them went back across the water to take counsel with those who waited there. They talked long, and anxiously those on the Spanish side awaited their return. At length one of their messengers returned, and going to Menendez he offered him a large sum of money, if he would swear to spare their lives. But Menendez would promise nothing. The Frenchmen were helpless, they were starving and in his hands, and both he and they knew it. They saw no hope anywhere, so they yielded to the Spanish general's demands. Once more the boat was sent across the water, and this time it came back laden with banners, arms, and armor. Then, guarded by Spanish soldiers, the Frenchmen were brought across by tens. As each batch landed, they found themselves prisoners, their arms were taken from them, and their hands were tied behind their backs. All day, hour after hour, the boat plied to and fro, and when all the Frenchmen had been brought over, they were ordered to march forward. The Spanish general walked in front, but he did not go far, for the sun was already setting, and it was time to camp for the night. So but a little way from the shore he stopped, and drew a line in the sand. And when the wretched Frenchmen reached that line, weaponless and helpless as they were, they were one and all put to death. Then, glorying in his deed, Menendez returned to St. Augustine. But he had not yet completely wiped out the French colony, for besides those he had so ruthlessly slain, there was another large party under Ribot, who, ignorant of all that had happened, were still slowly making their way to Fort Caroline. But again news of their whereabouts was brought to Menendez by Indians, and again he set off to waylay them. He found them on the same spot as he had found the first party, but this time the Frenchmen had made a raft, and upon this they were preparing to cross the water, when the Spaniards came upon them. The Frenchmen were in such misery that many of them greeted the appearance of their enemies with joy, but others were filled with misgiving. Still they resolved to try to make terms with the Spaniards, so first one of his officers, and then Ribot himself, rode across the strip of water to parley with the Spanish leader. They found him as pitiless as their companions had found him, and seeing that they could make no terms with him, many of the Frenchmen refused to give themselves up, and they marched away. But after much parleying, and many comings and goings across the river, Ribot, believing that Menendez would spare their lives, yielded up himself and the rest of his company to the Spaniards. He was soon undeceived, for he was led away among the bushes, and his hands were tied behind his back. As his followers came over, they too were bound and led away. Then as trumpets blew and drums beat, the Spaniards fell upon their helpless prisoners, and slew them to a man. When Ribot saw that his hour was come, he did not flinch. "'We are but dust,' he said, "'and to dust we must return.' Twenty years more or less can matter little. So with the words of a psalm upon his lips he met the sword-thrust. Not till every man lay dead was the fury of the Spaniards sated. Then, his horrible labor ended, Menendez returned once more in triumph to his fort. Those of the French who had refused to give themselves up to Menendez now wandered back to the shore where their ship had been wrecked. Out of the broken pieces they tried to build a ship in which they might sail homeward, but again news of their doings was brought to Menendez by the Indians, and again he set out to crush them. When the Frenchmen saw the Spaniards come they fled in terror, but Menendez sent a messenger after them promising that if they yielded to him he would spare their lives. Most of them yielded, and Menendez kept his promise. He treated his prisoners well, but when an opportunity arrived— he sent them home to end their lives as galley slaves. End of chapter 9. Read on October 26, 2007, in Oceanside, California.
This Country of Ours, Chapter 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours, Chapter 10. How a Frenchman Avenged the Death of His Countrymen. When the news of these terrible massacres reached France, it was greeted with a cry of horror. Even the boy king, Charles the Ninth, Catholic though he was, demanded redress. But the king of Spain declared that the Frenchmen had been justly served. The land upon which they had settled was his, he said, and they had no right to be there. He was sorry that they were Frenchmen, but they were also pirates and robbers, and had received only the just reward of their misdeeds. Neither Charles nor his mother, who was the real ruler in France at this time, wished to quarrel with the king of Spain, so, finding that no persuasions would move him, and that instead of being punished, Menendez was praised and rewarded, they let the matter drop. But there was one man in France who would not thus tamely submit to the tyranny of Spain. His name was Dominique de Gorges. He hated the Spaniards with a deadly hatred, and when he heard of the Florida massacre, he vowed to avenge the death of his countrymen. He sold all that he had, borrowed what money he could, and with three ships and a goodly company of soldiers and sailors, set sail. At first, however, he kept his real object secret. Instead of steering straight for Florida, he steered southward, making believe that he was going to Africa for slaves. But after encountering storms and contrary winds, he turned westward, and when off the coast of Cuba, he gathered all his men together and told them what he had set out to do. In vivid, terrible words he recounted to them the horrible slaughter. "'Shall we let such cruelty go unpunished?' he asked. "'What fame for us if we avenge it? To this end I have given my fortune, and I counted on you to help me. Was I wrong?' "'No!' they all cried. "'We will go with you to avenge our countrymen.' So, with hearts filled with thoughts of vengeance, they sailed onward to Fort Caroline. The Spaniards had repaired the fort, and now called it Fort Mateo. They had also built two small forts nearer the mouth of the river to guard the entrance to it. Now one afternoon the men in these forts saw three ships go sailing by. These were the French ships belonging to Gorges and his companions. But the men in the forts thought that they were Spanish ships, and therefore fired a salute. Gorges did not undeceive them. He fired a salute in reply, and, sailing on as if he were going elsewhere, was soon lost to sight. At length, having found a convenient place out of sight of the forts, he drew to the shore. But when he would have landed, he saw that the whole beach was crowded with savages, armed with bows and arrows, and ready for war. For the Indians, too, had taken the strange ships to be Spanish, and as they had grown to hate the Spaniards with a deadly hatred, they were prepared to withstand their landing. Fortunately, however, Gorges had on board a trumpeter who had been in Florida with Laudonniere, so now he sent him on shore to talk with the Indians, and as soon as they recognized him they greeted him with shouts of joy. Then they led him at once to their chief, who was no other than Saturiona, Laudonniere's one-time friend. So, amid great rejoicings, the Frenchmen landed. Then Saturiona poured into their ears the tale of his wrongs. He told them how the Spaniards stole their corn, drove them from their huts and their hunting grounds, and generally ill-treated them. Not one peaceful day, he said, have the Indians known, since the Frenchmen went away. When Gourges heard this, he was well pleased. If you have been ill-treated by the Spaniards, he said, the French will avenge you. At this Saturiona leapt for joy. "'What?' he cried. "'Will you fight the Spaniards?' "'Yes,' replied Gorge. "'But you must do your part also.' "'We will die with you,' cried Saturiona, "'if need be.' "'That is well,' said Gorge. "'How soon can you be ready? "'For if we fight, we should fight at once.' "'In three days we can be ready,' said the Indian. "'See to it, then,' said Gorge, "'that you are secret in the matter, "'so that the Spaniards suspect nothing.' "'Have no fear,' replied Saturiona. "'We wish them more ill than you do.' The third day came, and, true to his word, Saturiona appeared, surrounded by hundreds of warriors, fearful in paint and feathers. Then, some by water, some by land, the French and Indians set forth, 
and after many hardships and much toil they reached one of the forts which the Spaniards had built near the river's mouth. From the shelter of the surrounding trees they gazed upon it. "'There!' cried Gorge. "'There at last are the thieves who have stolen this land from our king. There are the murderers who slew our countrymen.' At his words the men were hardly to be restrained. In eager whispers they begged to be led on. So the word was given, and the Frenchmen rushed upon the fort. The Spaniards had just finished their midday meal when a cry was heard from the ramparts. "'To arms! To arms! The French are coming!' They were taken quite unawares, and with but short resistance they fled. The French and Indians pursued them and hemmed them in, so that not one man escaped. In like manner the second fort was also taken, and every man slain or made prisoner. The next day was Sunday, and Gorge spent it resting, and making preparations to attack Fort Mateo. When the Spaniards in Fort Mateo saw the French, and their great host of yelling, dancing Indians, they were filled with fear, and in order to find out how strong the force really was, one of them dressed himself as an Indian, and crept within the French lines. But almost at once he was seen by a young Indian chief, and his disguise being thus discovered, he was seized and questioned. He owned that there were scarce three hundred men in the fort, and that, believing the French to number at least two thousand, they were completely terror-stricken. This news delighted Gorge, and next morning he prepared to attack. The fort was easily taken. When the Spaniards saw the French attack, panic seized them, and they fled into the forest. But there the Indians, mad with the desire of blood and vengeance, met them. Many fell before the tomahawks. Others turned back, choosing rather to die at the hands of the French than of the Indians. But which way they turned there was no escape. Nearly all were slain. A few only were taken prisoner. When the fight was over, Gorge brought all the prisoners from the three forts together. He led them to the trees where Menendez had hanged the Frenchmen a few months before. There he spoke to them. "'Did you think that such foul treachery, such abominable cruelty, would go unpunished?' he said. "'Nay, I, one of the most lowly of my king's subjects, have taken upon myself to avenge it. There is no name shameful enough with which to brand your deeds, no punishment severe enough to repay them. But though you cannot be made to suffer as you deserve, you shall suffer all that an enemy may honourably inflict.' Thus your fate shall be an example to teach others to keep the peace and friendly alliance which you have broken so wickedly. And having spoken thus sternly to the trembling wretches, Gorge ordered his men to hang them on the very same trees upon which Menendez had hanged the Frenchmen, and over their heads he nailed tablets of wood upon which were burned the words, Not as Spaniards or as mariners, but as traitors, robbers, and murderers. Then at length the vengeance of Gorge was satisfied, but indeed it was scarce complete, for Menendez, the chief mover and leader of the Spaniards, was safe in Europe, and beyond the reach of any private man's vengeance. The Spaniards, too, were strongly entrenched at St. Augustine, so strongly indeed that Gorge knew he had not force enough to oust them. He had not even men enough to keep the three forts he had won, so he resolved to destroy them. This delighted the Indians, and they worked with such vigour that in one day all three forts were made level with the ground. Then, having accomplished all that he had come to do, Gorge made ready to depart. Whereupon the Indians set up a wail of grief. With tears they begged the Frenchmen to stay, and when they refused they followed them all the way to the shore, praising them and giving them gifts, and praying them to return. So, leaving the savages weeping upon the shore, the Frenchmen sailed away, and little more than a month later they reached home. When they heard of what Gorge had done, the Huguenots rejoiced, and they greeted him with honour and praise. But Philip of Spain was furiously angry. He demanded that Gorge should be punished, and offered a large sum of money for his head. King Charles, too, being in fear of the King of Spain, looked upon him coldly, so that for a time he was obliged to flee away and hide himself. Gorge had used all his money to set forth on his expedition, so for a few years he lived in poverty, but Queen Elizabeth at length heard of him and his deeds, and as she, too, hated the Spaniards, she was pleased at what he had done, and she asked him to enter her service. Thus, at length, he was restored to honour and favour, and, in honour and favour, he continued, 
all the rest of his life. End of chapter 10. Read on October 26, 2007, in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours, Chapter 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. This Country of Ours by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 11. The Adventures of Sir Humphrey Gilbert. The terrible disasters in Florida did not altogether stop French adventurers from going to the New World, but to avoid conflict with Spain they sailed henceforth more to the northern shores of America, and endeavoured to found colonies there. This made Englishmen angry, for by right of Cabot's voyages they claimed all America, from Florida to Newfoundland, which, says a writer in the time of Queen Elizabeth, they bought and annexed unto the crown of England. The English, therefore, looked upon the French as interlopers and usurpers. The French, however, paid little attention to the English claims. They explored the country, named mountains, rivers, capes, and bays, and planted colonies where they liked. Thus began the long two hundred years' struggle between the French and English for possession of North America. The French had already planted a colony on the St. Lawrence when an Englishman, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, determined also to plant one in North America. He was the first Englishman ever to attempt to found a colony in America. Many Englishmen had indeed sailed there before him, but they had only gone in quest of gold and of adventures, and without any thought of founding a new England across the seas. This now, with Queen Elizabeth's permission, was what Sir Humphrey hoped to do. He set out with a little fleet of five ships. One of these was called the Raleigh, and had been fitted out by the famous Sir Walter Raleigh, who was Gilbert's stepbrother. Walter Raleigh, no doubt, would gladly have gone with the company himself, but he was at the time in high favour with good Queen Bess, and she forbade him to go on any such dangerous expedition. So he had to content himself with helping to fit out expeditions for other people. The Raleigh was the largest ship of the little fleet, and Sir Walter spared no cost in fitting it out. But before they had been two days at sea, the captain of the Raleigh and many of his men fell ill, this so greatly discouraged them that they turned back to Plymouth. Sir Humphrey was sad indeed at the loss of the largest and best fitted ship of his expedition, but he held on his way undaunted. They had a troublous passage. Contrary winds, fogs, and icebergs delayed them. In a fog two of the ships named the Swallow and the Squirrel separated from the others, but still Sir Humphrey sailed on. At length land came in sight but it was a barren, unfriendly coast, nothing but hideous rocks and mountains, bare of trees and void of any green herbs, says one who went with the expedition. And seeing it so uninviting, they sailed southward along the coast, looking for a fairer land. And now, to their great joy, they fell in again with the swallow. The men in the swallow were glad, too, to see the golden hind and the delight once more. They threw their caps into the air and shouted aloud for joy. Soon after the reappearance of the swallow, the squirrel also turned up, so the four ships were together again. Together they sailed into the harbour of St. John's in Newfoundland. Here they found fishermen from all countries, for Newfoundland had by this time become famous as a fishing ground, and every summer ships from all countries went there to fish. Sir Humphrey, armed as he was with a commission from Queen Elizabeth, was received with all honour and courtesy by these people and on Monday, August 5, 1583, he landed, and solemnly took possession of the country for two hundred leagues north, south, east, and west, in the name of England's Queen. First his commission was read aloud, and interpreted to those of foreign lands who were there. Then one of Sir Humphrey's followers brought him a twig of a hazel tree, and a sod of earth, and put them into his hands, as a sign that he took possession of the land and all that was in it. Then proclamation was made that these lands belonged to Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth of England, by the grace of God. 
and if any person shall utter words sounding to the dishonour of her majesty, he shall lose his ears, and have his ship and goods confiscate. The arms of England, engraved on lead and fixed to a pillar of wood, were then set up, and after prayer to God the ceremony came to an end. Thus Newfoundland became an English possession, and by right of Sir Humphrey Gilbert's claims, it is the oldest colony of the British Empire. Sir Humphrey Gilbert had taken possession of the land, but it soon became plain that it would be impossible to found a colony with the wild riff-raff of the sea of which his company was formed. Troubles began at once. A few, indeed, went about their business quietly, but others spent their time in plotting mischief. They had no desire to stay in that far country, so some hid in the woods waiting a chance to steal away in one or other of the ships, which were daily sailing homeward laden with fish. Others, more bold, plotted to steal one of Sir Humphrey's ships and sail home without him, but their plot was discovered. They, however, succeeded in stealing a ship belonging to some other adventurers. It was laden with fish and ready to depart homeward. In this they sailed away, leaving its owners behind. The rest of Sir Humphrey's men now clamoured more than ever to be taken home, and at length he yielded to them, but the company was now much smaller than when he set out for besides those who had stolen away, many had died, and many more were sick. There were not enough men to man all four ships, so the swallow was left with the sick, and a few colonists who wished to remain, and in the other three Sir Humphrey put to sea with the rest of his company. He did not, however, sail straight homeward, for he wanted to explore still further, and find, if he could, an island to the south, which he had heard was very fertile. But the weather was stormy, and before they had gone far the delight was wrecked, and nearly all on board were lost. This was a heavy and grievous event, to lose at one blow our chief ship freighted with great provision, gathered together with much travail, care, long time, and difficulty. But more was the loss of our men to the number almost of a hundred souls. So wrote Master Edward Hay, who commanded the Golden Hind, and who afterwards wrote the story of the expedition. After this heavy chance, the two ships that remained beat up and down, tacking with the wind, Sir Humphrey hoping always that the weather would clear up, and allow him once more to get near land. But day by day passed. The wind and waves continued as stormy as ever, and no glimpse of land did the weary sailors catch. It was bitterly cold, food was growing scarce, and day by day the men lost courage. At length they prayed Sir Humphrey to leave his search and return homeward. Sir Humphrey had no wish to go, but seeing his men shivering and hungry he felt sorry for them, and resolved to do as they wished. "'Be content,' he said. "'We have seen enough. If God send us safe home, we will set forth again next spring.' So the course was changed, and the ships turned eastward. "'The wind was large for England,' says Hay, "'but very high, and the sea rough. It was so rough that the squirrel in which Sir Humphrey sailed was almost swallowed up, for the squirrel was only a tiny frigate of ten tons, and seeing it battered to and fro, and in danger of sinking every moment, the captain of the Golden Hind and many of the others prayed Sir Humphrey to leave it and come aboard their boat, but Sir Humphrey would not. "'I will not forsake my little company going homeward,' he said, "'for I have passed through many storms and perils with them.' No persuasions could move him, so the captain of the Golden Hind was fain to let him have his way." One afternoon in September those in the Golden Hind watched the little squirrel anxiously as it tossed up and down among the waves. But Sir Humphrey seemed not a whit disturbed. He sat in the stern, calmly reading, and seeing the anxious faces of his friends he cheerfully waved his hand to them. "'We are as near to heaven by sea as by land,' he called, through the roar of waves. Then the sun went down. Darkness fell over the wild sea, and the ships could only know each other's whereabouts by the tossing lights. Suddenly to the men on the Golden Hind it seemed as if the lights of the little frigate went out. Immediately the watch cried out that the frigate was lost. It was too true, for in that moment the frigate was devoured and swallowed up by the sea. Yet the men on the Golden Hind would not give up hope. All that night they kept watch, straining their eyes through the stormy darkness in the hope of catching sight of the frigate, or of some of its crew. But morning came, and there was no sign of it on all the wide waste of waters. Still they hoped, 
and all the way to England they hailed every small sail which came in sight, trusting still that it might be the squirrel, but it never appeared. Of the five ships which set forth, only the Golden Hind returned to tell the tale, and thus ended the first attempt to found an English colony in the New World. End of chapter 11. Read on October 26, 2007, in Oceanside, California. This Country of Ours, Chapter 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This Country of Ours by H. E. Marshall, Chapter 12. ABOUT SIR WALTER RALEIGH'S ADVENTURES IN THE GOLDEN WEST The first attempt to found an English colony in America had been an utter failure, but the idea of founding a new England across the seas had now taken hold of Sir Humphrey's young stepbrother, Walter Raleigh, and a few months after the return of the Golden Hind he received from the Queen a charter very much the same as his brother's, but although he got the charter, Raleigh himself could not sail to America, for Queen Elizabeth would not let him go. So again he had to content himself with sending other people. It was on April 27th, 1584, that his expedition set out in two small ships. Raleigh knew some of the great Frenchmen of the day, and had heard of their attempt to found a colony in Florida and in spite of the terrible fate of the Frenchmen he thought Florida would be an excellent place to found an English colony. So Raleigh's ships made their way to Florida, and landed on Roanoke Island, off the coast of what is now North Carolina. In those days, of course, there was no Carolina, and the Spaniards called the whole coast Florida, right up to the shores of Newfoundland. The Englishmen were delighted with Roanoke. It seemed to them a fertile, pleasant land, the most plentiful, sweet, fruitful, and wholesome of all the world. So they at once took possession of it, in the right of the Queen's most excellent majesty, as rightful Queen and Princess of the same. The natives, too, seemed friendly, and in their behaviour as mannerly and civil as any man of Europe, but the pale faces and the redskins found it difficult to understand each other. "'What do you call this country?' asked an Englishman. Wingandakoa, answered the Indian. So the Englishmen went home to tell of the wonderful country of Wingandakoa. But what the Indian had really said was, What fine clothes you have! However, the mistake did not matter much, for the Englishmen now changed the name of the land from whatever it had been to Virginia, in honour of their queen. This first expedition to Roanoke was only for exploring, and after a little the adventurers sailed home again to tell of all that they had seen. But Raleigh was so pleased with the report of Roanoke Island, which they brought home to him, that he at once began to make plans for founding a colony there. And the following April his ships were ready, and the expedition set out under his cousin, Sir Richard Grenville. But now almost as soon as they landed troubles began with the Indians. One of them stole a silver cup, and as it was not returned, the Englishmen in anger set fire to the cornfields, and destroyed them. This was a bad beginning, but the Englishmen had no knowledge yet of how cruel and revengeful the red man could be, so it was with no misgivings that Sir Richard left a colony of over a hundred men in the country, and promising to return with fresh supplies in the following spring, he sailed homeward. The governor of this colony was named Ralph Lane. He was wise and able, but he was soon beset with difficulties. He found that the place chosen for a colony was not a good one, for the harbour was bad, the coast dangerous, and many of the Indians were now unfriendly. So he set about exploring the country, and decided as soon as fresh supplies came from England to move to a better spot. Spring came and passed, and no ships from England appeared. The men began to starve, and seeing this, the Indians who had feared them before now began to be scornful, and taunt them. "'Your God is not a true God,' they said, "'or he would not leave you to starve.' They refused to sell the colonists' food, no matter what price was offered. Their hatred of the English was so great indeed that they resolved to sow no corn, in order that there should be no harvest, being ready to suffer hunger themselves, if they might destroy the colony utterly.' 
as the days passed the Englishmen daily felt the pinch of hunger more and more. Then Lane divided his company into three, and sent each in a different direction, so that they might gather roots and herbs, and catch fish for themselves, and also keep a lookout for ships. But things went from bad to worse. The savages grew daily bolder and more insolent, and the colonists lived constantly in dread of an attack from them. At length, although he had tried hard to avoid it, Lane was forced to fight them. They were easily overcome, and fled to the woods, but Lane knew well that his advantage was only for the moment. Should help not come, the colony would be wiped out. Then one day, about a week after the fight with the Indians, news was brought to Lane that a great fleet of twenty-three ships had appeared in the distance. Were they friends, or were they foes? That was the great question. The English knew the terrible story of Fort Caroline. Were these Spanish ships? Fearing that they might be, Ralph Lane looked to his defences, and made ready to withstand the enemy, if enemy they proved to be, as bravely as might be. But soon it was seen that their fears were needless. The ships were English, and two days later Sir Francis Drake anchored in the wretched little harbour. Drake had not come on purpose to relieve the colony. He had been out on one of his marauding expeditions against the Spaniards. He had taken and sacked St. Domingo, Cartagena, and Fort St. Augustine. And now, sailing home in triumph, chance had brought him to Raleigh's colony at Roanoke. And when he saw the miserable condition of the colonists, and heard the tale of their hardships, he offered to take them all home to England. Or, he said, if they chose to remain, he would leave them a ship and food, and everything that was necessary to keep them from want, until help should come. Both Lane and his chief officers, who were men of spirit, wanted to stay, so they accepted Drake's offer of the loan of a ship, agreeing that, after they had found a good place for a colony and a better harbour, they would go home to England, and return again next year. Thus the matter was settled. Drake began to put provisions on board one of his ships for the use of the colony. The colonists on their side began writing letters to send home with Drake's ships. All was business and excitement, but in the midst of it a great storm arose. It lasted for four days, and was so violent that most of Drake's ships were forced to put out to sea, lest they should be dashed to pieces upon the shore. Among the ships thus driven out to sea was that which Drake had promised to give Ralph Lane, and when the storm was over it was nowhere to be seen. So Drake offered another ship to Lane. It was a large one, too large to get into the little harbour, but the only one he could spare. Lane was now doubtful what was best to do. Did it not seem as if by driving away their ship God had stretched out his hand to take them from thence? Was the storm not meant as a sign to them? So, not being able to decide by himself what was best to do, Lane called his officers and gentlemen together, and asked advice of them. They all begged him to go home. No help had come from Sir Richard Grenville, nor was it likely to come, for Drake had brought the news that war between Spain and England had been declared. They knew that at such a time every Englishman would bend all his energies to the defeat of Spain, and that Raleigh would have neither thoughts nor money to spare for that far-off colony. At length it was settled that they should all go home. In haste, then, the Englishman got on board, for Drake was anxious to be gone from the dangerous anchorage, which caused him more peril of wreck, says Ralph Lane, than all his former most honourable actions against the Spaniards. So on the 19th of June, 1586, the colonists set sail and arrived in England some six weeks later. They brought with them two things which afterward proved to be of great importance. The first was tobacco. The use of it had been known ever since the days of Columbus, but it was now for the first time brought to England. The second was the potato. This Raleigh planted on his estates in Ireland, and to this day Ireland is one of the great potato-growing countries of the world. But meanwhile Raleigh had not forgotten his colonists, and scarce a week after they had sailed away a ship arrived, laden with all manner of things in most plentiful manner for the supply and relief of his colony. For some time the ship beat up and down the coast searching vainly for the colony, and at length finding no sign of it it returned to England. About a fortnight later Sir Richard Grenville also arrived with three ships. To his astonishment, when he reached Roanoke, he saw no sign of the ship which he knew had sailed shortly before him. 
and to his still greater astonishment he found the colony deserted. Yet he could not believe that it had been abandoned, so he searched the country up and down in the hope of finding some of the colonists. But finding no trace of them, he at length gave up the search, and returned to the forsaken huts. And being unwilling to lose possession of the country, he determined to leave some of his men there. So fifteen men were left behind, well provided with everything necessary to keep them for two years. Then Sir Richard sailed homeward. In spite of all these mischances, Raleigh would not give up his great idea, and the following year he fitted out another expedition. This time there were a few women among the colonists, and John White, who had already been out with Lane, was chosen as governor. It was now decided to give up Roanoke, which had proved such an unfortunate spot, and the new company of colonists was bound for Chesapeake Bay. But before they settled there they were told to go to Roanoke, to pick up the fifteen men left by Sir Richard Grenville, and take them to Chesapeake also. When, however, they reached Roanoke, the master of the vessels, who was by birth a Spaniard, and who was perhaps in league with the Spanish, said that it was too late in the year to go seeking another spot. So whether they would or not he landed the colonists, and sailed away, leaving only one small boat with them. Thus, perforce, they had to take up their abode in the old spot. They found it deserted. The fort was razed to the ground, and although the huts were still standing, they were choked with weeds and overgrown with wild vines, while deer wandered in and out of the open doors. It was plain that for many months no man had lived there, and although careful search was made, saving the bones of one, no sign was found of the fifteen men left there by Sir Richard. At length the new colonists learned from a few friendly Indians that they had been traitorously set upon by hostile Indians. Most of them were slain. The others escaped in their boat, and went no man knew whither. The Englishmen were very angry when they heard that, and wanted to punish the Indians, so they set out against them. But the Indians fled at their coming, and the Englishmen by mistake killed some of the friendly Indians instead of their enemies. Thus things were made worse instead of better. And now, amid all these troubles, on the 18th of August, 1587, a little girl was born. Her father was Ananias Dare, and her mother was the daughter of John White, the governor. The little baby was thus the granddaughter of the governor, and because she was the first English child to be born in Virginia, she was called Virginia. But matters were not going well in the colony. Day by day the men were finding out things which were lacking, and which they felt they must have if they were not all to perish. So a few days after Virginia was christened, all the chief men came to the governor, and begged him to go back to England to get fresh supplies, and other things necessary to the life of the colony. John White, however, refused to go. The next day not only the men but the women also came to him, and again begged him to go back to England. They begged so hard that at last the governor consented to go. All were agreed that the place they were now in was by no means the best which might be chosen for a colony, and it had been determined that they should move some fifty miles further inland. Now it was arranged that if they moved while the governor was away, they should carve on the trees and posts of the door the name of the place to which they had gone, so that on his return he might be able easily to find them and also it was arranged that if they were in any trouble or distress they should carve a cross over the name. All these matters being settled, John White set forth, and it was with great content that the colonists saw their governor go, for they knew that they could send home no better man to look after their welfare, and they were sure he would bring back the food and other things which were needed. But when White arrived in England he found that no man, not even Raleigh, had a thought to spare for Virginia, for Spain was making ready all her mighty sea-power to crush England, and the English were straining every nerve to meet and break that power. So John White had to wait with what patience he could. Often his heart was sick when he thought of his daughter and his little granddaughter, Virginia Dare, far away in that great unknown land across the sea. Often he longed to be back beside them, but his longings were of no avail. He could but wait, for every ship was seized by government and pressed into the service of the country. And while the Spaniards were at the gate it was accounted treason for any Englishman to set sail to western lands. So the summer of 1588 passed, the autumn came, 
and at length the great armada sailed from Spain. It sailed across the narrow seas in pride and splendour, haughtily certain of crushing the insolent sea-dogs of England. But God blew with his breath, and they were scattered. Before many days were over, these proud ships were fleeing before the storm, their sails torn, their masts splintered. They were shattered upon the rocky shores of Scotland and Ireland. They were swallowed by the deep. The sea-power of Spain was broken, and the history of America truly began. For, as has been said, the defeat of the Invincible Armada was the opening event in the history of the United States. Free now from the dread of Spain, ships could come and go without hindrance. But another year and more passed before John White succeeded in getting ships and provisions, and setting out once more for Virginia. It was for him an anxious voyage, but as he neared the place where the colony had been, his heart rejoiced, for he saw smoke rising from the land. It was dark, however, before they reached the spot, and seeing no lights, save that of a huge fire far in the woods, the governor sounded a trumpet call. The notes of the trumpet rang through the woods and died away to silence. Answer there was none. So the men called and called again, but still no answer came. Then, with sinking heart, John White bade them sing some well-known English songs, for that, he thought, would surely bring an answer from the shore. So through the still night air the musical sound of men's voices rang out, but still no answer came from the silent fort. With a heart heavy as lead, the governor waited for the dawn. As soon as it was light he went ashore. The fort was deserted. Grass and weeds grew in the ruined houses, but upon a post, in fair capital letters, was carved the word Croatoan. This was the name of a neighboring island inhabited by friendly Indians. There was no cross or sign of distress carved over the letters, and when the governor saw that he was greatly comforted. He spent some time searching about for other signs of the colonists. In one place he found some iron and lead thrown aside as if too heavy to carry away, and now overgrown with weeds. In another he found five chests, which had evidently been buried by the colonists, and dug up again by the Indians. They had been burst open, and the contents lay scattered about the grass. Three of these chests John White saw were his own, and it grieved him greatly to see his things spoiled and broken. His books were torn from their covers, his pictures and maps were rotten with the rain, and his armor almost eaten through with rust. At length, having searched in vain for any other signs of the colonists, the English returned to the ships and set sail for Croatoan. But now they encountered terrible storms. Their ships were battered this way and that, their sails were torn, their anchors lost, and at length, in spite of all entreaties, the captain resolved to make sail for England. So John White never saw Croatoan, never knew what had become of his dear ones. And what happened to little Virginia Dare, the first English girl to be born on the soil of the United States, will never be known. But years afterwards the settlers were told by the Indians that the white people left at Roanoke had gone to live among the Indians. For some years it was said they all lived in a friendly manner together. In time, however, the medicine men began to hate the pale faces, and caused them all to be slain, except four men, one young woman, and three boys. Was the young woman perhaps Virginia Dare? No one can tell. All Raleigh's attempts at founding a colony had thus come to nothing. Still he did not despair. Once again he sent out an expedition, but that too failed, and the leader returned having done nothing. Even this did not break Raleigh's faith in the future of Virginia. "'I shall yet live to see it an English nation,' he said. But although Raleigh's faith was as firm as before, his money was gone. He had spent enormous sums on his fruitless efforts to found a colony. Now he had no more to spend. And now great changes came. Good Queen Bess died, and James of Scotland reigned in her stead. Raleigh fell into disgrace, was imprisoned in the tower, and after a short release was beheaded there. Thus an end came to all his splendid schemes. Never before, perhaps, had such noble devotion to king and country been so basely requited. 
At the time it was said that never before was English justice so injured or so disgraced as by the sentence of death passed upon Raleigh. No man is perfect, nor was Raleigh perfect, but he was a great man, and although all his plans failed, we remember him as the first great colonizer, the first Englishman to gain possession of any part of North America. End of chapter 12, and that's the end of the first part of This Country of Ours, by H. E. Marshall, read by Kara Schallenberg.